uh, quorum or staff is ready, I'd like to get started. Great. Okay, uh, I'd like to call to order uh, this meeting of the Public Safety Finance and Strategic Support Committee. If we can get a roll call, please. Arenas? Jones? Mahan? Here. Jimenez? Here. Perales? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. And Ruth, mm -hmm. I'm here as well. This is Councilmember Arenas. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. And then next up is the review of our work plan. Any items recommended for uh, referral, or excuse me, deferral additions? Not seeing any from my colleagues. If we can get a motion to approve the work plan. Motion to approve. Oh, second. Motion and second. We can get a roll call vote, please. Arenas? Yes. Jones? Mahan? Aye. Jimenez? Aye. Perales? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I apologize as a note for our attendees here. Uh, if you wish to speak on any item, you can uh, raise your hand when that item arises. Um, or if you're on the phone, you can utilize star nine. And uh, next up is our consent agenda. Um, so anybody would like to pull a consent item? If not, uh, if we can get a motion to approve. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. I don't see any members of the public would like to speak on this. We can get a roll call vote, please. Arenas? Yes. Jones? Mahan? Aye. Jimenez? Aye. Perales? Aye. Thank you. Great. Thank you. This moves us on to item uh, D1. Here. And Oh, yes, sorry, go ahead. I, I, I'm so sorry. I, I did have a comment um, and a, quite a bit of a question on consent calendar number one, uh, C1. Okay. Go, go ahead. I, I apologize about this, but I was wondering, um, I, I had been reading about uh, the, um, the real estate market, how it continued to be strong um, despite the pandemic and how uh, the median single family home was um, even higher than last February. And one of my questions is, um, is there more um, uh, corporations purchasing single family homes? Uh, are there, is this more, um, you know, local or buyer to buyer? Is there a way to help distinguish between that? Hi, council member, this is Selena Yubondo from the city manager's budget office. Unfortunately, the information that we receive on our real estate activity, we were still receive that from um, Santa Clara County Association of Realtors. And it really does not break up the information by who is making the purchase. It is just simple. Um, here are the number of purchases. Here's the amount that we received. Um, so it's more transactional based. We don't have background on who who is behind the transactions. Um, and I think Captain Mata live mic, just in case. <laughs> chief, chief, chief. Um, but we could definitely work with um, Office of Economic Development (OED) and see if they have any sort of um, background information that they can help provide. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if they do, but I, we can definitely work work with them and see what they may have and provide some information to your office or at least do a follow-up with your office. Yeah, the, thank you so much. I know that um, across the nation, this is the case where there's a lot of um, folks uh, losing their rentals or even um, and getting kicked out um, because there's a corporation that's purchasing their, their single family home rental. Um, and I just wanted to know if that's the trend that we are seeing here in San Jose, um, because it's putting really everyday families further um, from from that American dream in terms of generational wealth, um, being able to establish that. So in order for us to, to respond to a trend, we have to learn about it. And it would be great to, to see if we can get that 
um, forwarded to us at some point, Selena. Thank you. We will look into it and get back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Uh, did uh, do you want to reconsider your vote on that, Councilor Ardenas? No, th thank you, Chair. Okay, great. We will go back down then to item uh, D1, which is our Police Department Operations and Performance Bi-Monthly Status Report. And we've got a lot of uh, new faces to the PISFIS Committee uh, today. Um, and I know uh, Councilor Ardenas uh, slipped uh, mentioning uh, our new chief's uh, open mic uh, and called him a captain, but uh, he's our he's our new chief. Um, and um, and we do have some some new faces uh, as well that we'll um, be happy to introduce. I will just start off with our two new deputy chiefs, though, uh, Stan McFadden and Al Washburn. So uh, welcome. And I'll turn it over to you, Chief. Unless maybe it's uh, uh thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. <clears throat> Um, yes, uh, just uh, to reiterate what um, uh, Chairman Perales mentioned, that uh, we have two deputy chiefs um, that were recently appointed here, I think uh, starting on their second week, is uh, Deputy Chief uh, Stan McFadden and Deputy Chief L. Washburn. Uh, uh, Chief McFadden uh, oversees the Bureau of Field Operation. He was uh, previously the captain in the Central Division. And we did a great job and I know we'll uh, continue to do so uh, for the whole city. Um, and then uh, we have Deputy Chief L. Washburn, who's assigned to the Bureau of Investigations. Uh, and she was formerly the captain in the Southern Division, where she also uh, did amazing work out there with our community and our, and our council members uh, in each uh, respective district. So again, I wanna welcome them as well um, to, this, um, to this meeting uh, to get, and then for everyone else to uh, get to know them. So thank you, Chair for the opportunity. You're welcome, thank you. I think we have uh, Lieutenant Donahue leading this presentation. Yes, thank you, Chair. I will go ahead and share my screen. All right, Chairman Perales, can you see that? Yes, Excellent. yes, we can, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you and good afternoon. My name is Lieutenant Steve Donahue and I'm the commander of the Research and Development Unit of the San Jose Police Department. Today I'll be presenting the Police Department's bi-monthly operations and performance status report. We'll be covering part one, citywide crime statistics, and from those I will discuss emerging issues of vehicle theft. Then I'll be presenting on other matters of interest, including the sexual assault strategy update and the redistricting update. And at that point, I'll pass the presentation on to my colleagues. Lieutenant Jorge Gutierrez of the Gang Investigations Unit will be presenting on violent and gang-related crime data. Lieutenant David Naya of the Traffic Enforcement Unit is going to report on their staffing. And finally, Officer Mike Treniglia will be presenting, I'm sorry, <laughs> Officer James Treniglia will be presenting an overview of the Mobile Crisis Assessment Team. So we are going to begin with our citywide part one UCR crime stats. As you can see, under violent offenses, we have a reduction of 14% in rapes as compared to the same period last year. However, we had an increase in aggravated assaults, which was 21% higher compared to the same period last year and 26% higher than the five-year average. When we look at profits, it was 29% higher compared to the same period last year and was 9% higher than the five-year average. As an emerging issue, we took a deeper look into vehicle thefts. This heat map that you see on your screen now represents the vehicle thefts occurring in January and February of 2021. And as you can see, this is a citywide issue with hotspots in all four divisions. This information was provided to the Bureau of Field Operations and they're going to be conducting patrol checks in the hotspot areas. In addition, we're working with the Traffic Investigations Unit and the Regional Auto Theft Task Force to look at trends and patterns in both stolen vehicle locations and recovery locations. We know this is a nationwide problem. According to UCR, stolen vehicles are up over 9% across the country and 25% in California alone. I'd like to note that in 2020, we had a 93% recovery rate on stolen vehicles. And in addition, 70% of those stolen vehicles were recovered locally meaning they were stolen in San Jose and recovered in San Jose. This indicates vehicles are primarily being taken and for transportation and driven within the city and recovered here. 
And then finally, when we look at the crime of auto theft itself, this is the zero bail crime in Santa Clara County. And as a result, there's no immediate consequence for those caught driving a stolen vehicle, limiting the fear of incarceration as a deterrent. When a driver is arrested and booked, they're immediately released without bail and placed back into the community. Now we will move on to other matters of interest, beginning with our sexual assault strategy update. When we look at rape offenses during this period compared to the four year, years prior, we see a reduction of 39% in attempted sexual assault, 32% reduction in rape, and 8% reduction in sodomy. We're seeing increases in spousal rape and domestic rape when compared to the average of the four years prior, and as was reported by Lieutenant Jimenez in the last PISFIS meeting. This is likely attributable to the intersectionality tool. Overall, we have a 12% reduction in sexual assaults when compared to the average of the four years prior. These charts show the current status of both city and countywide work items for the sexual assault strategy. Regarding the San Jose sexual assault work items, everything is either completed or in process, except for increasing the quantity of sexual assault investigations unit detectives, as you can see at the bottom. Allocations of department personnel are determined by the department's deployment needs. And while this is still on the horizon, we do not yet have the staffing that would allow for an additional team and sergeant in sexual assaults. You will also notice the addition of the Sexual Assault Bill of Rights, which I'll speak about in a moment. When we look at the countywide specific items, all items are either completed or in process. You'll notice the joint meeting between this committee and the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors regarding children, seniors, and families has moved from pending to in process as it's scheduled for April 29th. At the request of this committee, we've added this portion of the presentation regarding sexual assault bill of rights. I'll update the committee on this topic during my bi-monthly status report until its completion. We're taking a three-prong approach to the sexual assault bill of rights. First, we'll be creating duty manual sections requiring compliance with the bill of rights and requiring department personnel to provide mercies cards to survivors. Second, we'll be evaluating and reforming our department's resource cards to ensure that they provide the most up-to-date and comprehensive information to survivors. And finally, we will continue to collaborate with advocate and community partners to ensure best practices, maintain open communication, and develop additional policies and procedures to provide the highest level of support to survivors. At the request of this committee, we've also added this portion of the presentation regarding the department's redistricting. I will update the committee on this topic during my bi-monthly status reports. Now, there are five phases to the redistricting project. Right now, we're in the very beginning stages of the first phase. We're establishing a working group of department subject matter experts, and we'll be soon delivering an RF or developing an RFP for consultant to study all the aspects necessary for redistricting. And now I will pass the presentation to Lieutenant Jorge Gutierrez of the Gang Investigations Unit, who will be speaking on violent and gang-related crime data by the Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force hotspots and emerging hotspots. Jorge. Thank you, Steve. Um, today I'm going to be talking to you about the uh, Mayor, Mayor's Gang Pre Prevention Task Force uh, hotspots areas. In each division, we have designated designated um, several hotspots. Central Division in the Genie Avenue, Roosevelt Park, 10th and Williams, Julian Street. Southern Division, we have Seven Trees, Hoffman, Biamonte, Round Table, Great Oaks, Coy Park, and Tradewinds. In Foothill, we have Overfelt Area, Hokaway, Foxdale, Mayfair, Valley, Valley Palms, San Jose Apartments, and Colmar. And in Western Division, we have Cadillac Winchester, Washington Alma, Santee, Phelan, Buena Vista, and San Carlos. <clears throat> so uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Um, I'm, I'm going to be covering uh, the last year, calendar year uh, statistics, and I'm gonna give you a, uh, an overview of what uh, we have from uh, January to February. In Central Division, uh, in the 10th and uh, East Williams, we have we've had one incident. Uh, we had one in incident in 2019, 
2020, uh, we have zero incidents in the, the last uh, couple of months, January and February. And uh, in the Gini Avenue area, we had nine uh, incidents in the calendar year 2020. And we've had two incidents uh, since uh, the beginning of the year. Julian Street, we've had five incidents and we have we've had no incidents uh, uh, on January and February. And Roosevelt seems to be the busiest uh, area with nine and we've already had four in the in the in the month of January and February. <clears throat> Central Division, we had a total of 42 incidents uh, in the whole division and uh, we've we had two homicides uh, in Central. We also had, uh, we've also had 15 incidents since the, uh, in January and February. Next slide. Next, I'm gonna be covering Foothill Division, uh, which is one of the busiest divisions we've, we've uh, had incidents in. Um, Foxdale, we've had three incidents uh, in the uh, Foxdale apartments. Uh, or hotspot, and we have zero uh, thus far. Colmar, we have eight incidents in the uh, calendar year uh, 2020, and we've only had one uh, this year. Mayfair, we've had 10 incidents, and we haven't had any this year. Uh, <clears throat> Overfelt area, seven, and none this year. And Pokeway, which is, seems to be the busiest of all, uh, we've had 21 in the calendar, calendar year uh, 2020 and four already this year. Valley Palms three, and uh, we've only had one incident as of uh, January and February. Total in Foothill Division, we had 208 uh, gang-related incidents uh, throughout Foothill, and we had two homicides in uh, since January and February, we've only had 27 incidents in the Foothill Division. Next slide, please. Moving on to Southern Division, uh, Coy Park and Trade Winds, uh, we've, we had 12 incidents in 2020 uh, compared to one so far this year. Hoffman and Via Monte, three incidents. We, have, we haven't had any incidents uh, yet. And in round table, we've had 20 incidents, which is one of the busiest uh, in Southern Division. And we've had two thus far. Seven trees, four, and uh, two thus far this year. The total incidents, gang-related incidents in 2020, we had 114 and one homicide. And compared to this year, we've only had 13 incidents in Southern Division. Uh, next slide, please. Western Division, we've had um, one of the busiest also. Uh, Buena Vista and, and San Carlos, we've only had seven incidents, uh, two this year. Cadillac, Cadillac and Winchester, 28, um, and two this year. Center, Santee and Phelan, 16, with uh, six this year. And the Washington area, 19. Uh, the calendar year, calendar year 2020 and six uh, already. We had a total of 187 uh, incidents in Western and three homicides, uh, gang-related homicides in, uh, in Western Division. We've already had 38 uh, gang-related incidents in, uh, between January and February. We've had, uh, we, we got a total of, um, 48 homicides, uh, oh, I'm sorry, 41 homicides uh, last year. <clears throat> and we had uh, nine gang-related uh, homicides out of those uh, 41. And this year we've already had uh, one homicide in February and one uh, in March that are considered gang-related. And uh, now we'll pass the, the uh, presentation to Lieutenant Devanaya, who will be presenting on uh, traffic enforcement uh, updates. Okay, can you hear me, Steve?
Yes. Okay. <laughs> you were on mute and so was I. All right, so for traffic enforcement unit staffing, I'm here to provide an update today on what we are doing in the traffic enforcement unit. I know that this has been a source of contention as of recently, and I know we're getting a lot of support from council to uh, increase our staffing and traffic enforcement. So what we're looking at now is uh, on the left-hand side of your screen. Oops, I think we uh, skipped there. Go back to that last screen, Steve, please. There we go. So what we're looking at on the left-hand side of your screen where, it, where it's labeled old model, um, the teams that we're looking at there, we currently have one team and that, that consists of one sergeant and 11 officers. And they work Monday through Thursday, day shift hours from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. Our new proposed model, which is what we are moving to here shortly and hope to attain by the end of the summer, uh, is a two-team model. And we're going to split those teams up and have two sergeants and, and split those teams into uh, two separate sets of days off. And then we're gonna have a little bit more of an overlapping hours so we go into the evening a little bit. And what that will look like in the new model is what you're looking at on the right-hand side of your screen. We have one sergeant, six officers. They'll work Monday through Thursday from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. And then we have a secondary team, which works, uh, which is a one sergeant, six officers. They will be on duty Tuesday through Friday, and their hours will be 10 to 8 p.m. What that does is it gives us a, a good look at the evening commute, which is typically what we tend to miss a little bit in our enforcement strategy, and also has the officers here into darkness and providing uh, enforcement uh, up until about 7.30, 8 o'clock at night until they go uh, back to the police department to continue and write reports and things of that nature. So it gives us a, a more broad enforcement hours. It gives us a good look at the morning commute. Uh, we have a good look at the entire day. We have a good, a good scope of enforcement when school is in session to provide safety for the children walking to and from school in the morning and then also uh, back home from school in the afternoon. And then we get the evening commute with our afternoon team. And there's a good overlap in the middle of the day when kids are in school and uh, we can provide that, that level of safety we need on our streets for primarily for our kids during the day. And then uh, next screen, Steve, please. So just a reminder for the traffic enforcement unit. Now, a lot of people, we have this kind of this misnomer that all we do is traffic enforcement and all we do is go out and write tickets. So I just wanted to share with you today some of the other, other missions that we have. Uh, and that what we do uh, in a whole grand scale picture here at the traffic enforcement unit here at San Jose. So we do targeted enforcement and that includes our DUI checkpoints, our partnerships with, with Vision Zero and, and DOT, but we're also assigned to racer and sideshow enforcement on the weekends. We're called in for those major operations. We also do fight the spike, which is uh, some specialty type enforcement we do during darkness hours uh, with DOT. And um, those are things that we do at the, at the change of daylight savings typically to do education and enforcement for drivers driving during darkness when they're not used to driving during darkness. And then we also handle all of our grant operations that come through the police department. And those can include DUI checkpoints, DUI saturation cars. We do educational uh, events um, called Know Your Limit uh, out at different venues throughout the city. We do distracted driving campaigns. We do motorcycle enforcement. We have a click it or ticket campaign that a lot of you have heard of. We also do bicycle and pedestrian safety educational pieces as well as specific targeted enforcement. And, um, and then just general overall traffic safety education pieces for our schools and, uh, and also community groups throughout the city. Some of the special events we do um, we do all of our marches and protests and really any major event that comes through the city of San Jose. And last year with COVID, we, we had a limited number of major events, but we did have a lot of unrest and protests and things of that nature that we did handle. But um, in a normal year, we do the races and escorts and any type of dignitary escorts that come into the city. So the traffic enforcement has a, a broad spectrum of things that we do. Um, when it comes to events and, and grant related activities, as well as our regular day to day traffic enforcement and education. Um, and then we also handle equipment management throughout the throughout the department. So all of our PAS devices and that's a uh, preliminary alcohol screening device that is managed through the department. So every officer that can check one out to conduct DUI uh, investigations is is managed and is uh, calibrated and is um, just taken care of 
for lack of a better term, through the traffic enforcement unit, all of our handheld radar and LIDAR devices through the department, uh, as well as our unit are again managed and, and kept up to, up to uh, calibration and all the things that need to be done for court purposes and whatnot. And then anytime you see a radar trailer out in the city, uh, that is someone that's pulled from the traffic enforcement unit typically to deploy that trailer to make sure it is charged, to make sure it is, uh, is um, out in our community and, and we are utilizing them appropriately and we try, to, we try to place them throughout the city as a speed deterrent and educational piece uh, for our residents. So I just kind of wanted to get you up to speed on some of the things that we're doing as opposed to just being that narrow scope traffic enforcement where you see an officer out on a motorcycle riding a ticket. These are some of the other things that we do. So just more of an educational piece, I think, for everybody. So we're all on the same page and everybody knows what we do out in the community. And uh, that is all I have. I'm excited about uh, the new deployment. And we are currently looking at, um, at another sergeant to put into the unit and my hopes are that we will have that new two team deployment in place by the end of summertime. So that is all I have. And uh, Officer James Cernigli will be taking, uh, taking the next slide for the mobile crisis assessment team. Thank you. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Okay, very yes. good. Um, my Officer James Cernelia um, with the mobile crisis assessment team. Uh, before I get started, I want to introduce uh, a few folks from Santa Clara County Behavioral Health who are here with me. I have the division director, Sandra Hernandez, uh, the program manager, Amy Hayes, and our law enforcement liaison, John Costa. So uh, getting started, I'm uh, just going to go over the MCAT goals, which are uh, primarily to identify client needs, uh, ensure connection to care providers, establish and maintain partnerships with our city, county, and community stakeholders, develop innovative strategies in response to mental health crisis. Uh, uh, next slide, please. The staffing currently, uh, as we started the program, uh, it is a pilot program, obviously. It was one sergeant and two officers, two times a week on eight hour shifts. They operated from 11 to 7 p.m. Uh, and that was funded through a, a grant that we received from uh, the, the federal government, the Department of Justice. And currently, uh, we're able to have two sergeants and eight officers operating seven days a week. Those are going to be 10 hour shifts. They operate from 10 to 8 p.m. And then again, those four are four full time officers on a temporary assignment and four officers that are, are deployed through overtime. And they're all funded again through the grant. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the program model that we operate under is, is a two prong approach. Uh, we conduct non-urgent follow-up along with our county partners. Uh, the way that works primarily is our referral is received via patrol, our Bureau of Investigations or from the County Behavioral Health. Our MCAT officers or sergeants will do a, a threat assessment and some follow-up and then that information will go back to our county partners who do their side of the follow-up work. And then the county clinicians will coordinate with the MCAT officers on duty for the day and they'll go out to uh, field visits, conducting these non-urgent follow-ups to determine if uh, a hold is necessary or to provide additional resources. Uh, the second prong of this is uh, in-progress events. And these are where our MCAT officers can respond, uh, again, to in-progress events along with our county partners uh, to supplement patrol. Uh, they participate in these events for de-escalation and again, for patrol relief to get them back out to respond to um, priority calls. Um, while they're there, the clinicians will facilitate 5150 holds if necessary and uh, connection to additional resources, uh, continuing to follow up uh, if needed. Uh, next slide, please. The numbers you see here are, are countywide numbers and my, my partners can elaborate a little bit on these ones. <laughs> If there's questions, uh, the, the number to focus on primarily is referrals received to the county from SJPD in February. There were 96 that we sent to them. 75 field visits were conducted along with our mobile crisis team and our county um, partners and 19 5150 holds were written. And next slide, please. 
And then there's a program comparison. And this is a program comparison of the mobile crisis assessment team and a program out of Eugene, Oregon, which they call CAHOOTS. Uh, our program, especially trained officers and mental health crisis workers that respond to mental health calls for service. Uh, our teams, they link with people with mental illness to appropriate services and provide other effective and efficient responses. Our most common approach is for the officers and the crisis workers to ride together in the same vehicle for the entire shift, while other agencies, these crisis workers, uh, meet with the officers on scene and they handle the calls together. And that's what we do here. Uh, we don't operate in the same vehicle, but we do meet and then we respond together. And the teams are available to respond throughout the city uh, and specifically targeting areas with the greatest number of mental health needs. Uh, the CAHOOTS model, uh, these CAHOOTS programs are Calls are generated to 911 that are related to addiction, disorientation, and mental crisis, and homelessness, but pose no danger to others. These are the calls that get routed to CAHOOTS. Uh, the two team, uh, it's a two team response, which includes a medic and a mental health counselor, but no law enforcement. And CAHOOTS does not handle calls involving violence, weapons, crimes, uh, other medical emergencies, or similarly dangerous situations. And next slide. Um, and now we're available for your questions, and thank you. All right, thank you very much. You've covered a lot of topics there. Uh, so I'll first go over to our members of the public. And uh, if you would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand, uh, which I see a couple of hands going up. And we'll start with uh, Blair Beekman, and you'll have two minutes. Hi, thank you, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thank you for this item. Um, you know, I guess it's really important for myself that you know that that you've been doing uh, peer review programs with uh, domestic violence issues, but you know, there's other uh, issues of policing that uh, a peer review program can do really well. And I hope that you know if, if what I'm saying is just good reminders, but. You know, it's really important practices, I think. I think to develop an openness for police officers to talk to each other after an event is really important. And uh, it, I hope that how it works within the domestic violence program, I hope you can learn to expand that to the entire police department. And, and that's the kind of things that works for the whole community, you know, and that develops a whole mental health outlook, you know, of openness for the community instead of years of just being closed about subject matter. That is a big problem within police departments. Um, about issues of, uh, I don't know so much about gang related issues, but the sideshow issues, um, you have a certain approach that can be very mellow about and, and just uh, how to address low key, uh, to address, to address sideshows. I hope you can continue that. We don't need to dump a ton of new uh, police officers or technology into this, I don't feel. Uh, if you do use the ALPRs, make them uh, mobile and not permanent. And if you, you know, yeah, when, when you have those uh, stationary uh, mobile ALPR units, uh, take them out after a weekend. Don't leave them there week after week after week. And um, to conclude, uh, ghost gun issues, issues about guns. I don't think guns are so much uh, the issue within the sideshows. It's the ghost gun issues that are traveling interstate that you need to address. And we need to consider interstate issues before uh, you know, arresting all of the people at the sideshows for their new ghost gun uses. That is being addressed by the Biden administration. Work at the federal level, not bust. Thank you, Blair. And uh, next up is Gilsmore. Hi, sorry about that. All right, um, I just have one question that's uh, regarding uh, uh, Officer Siniglia's uh, presentation. Um, does the MCAT uh, program, the, the MCAT team, respond to any uh, MLK calls for service? And, and in addition, would it provide any mutual aid for San Jose State UPD? And Gail, I can uh, forward the question through when you're done with your public comment, but the, the speakers, uh, don't respond directly to questions from uh, the public. Okay, my apologies, sorry about that. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. If you had anything else, you can continue on for your two minutes. If not, then I'll, I can forward the question through. No, that's all. That's all I have. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, okay. We'll go back to members of the committee and actually I'll, I'll, I'll pass through if you don't mind, Councilmember Mayhan, uh, to see if we can get uh, Gil's question answered first. Sorry, would you like me to answer that, Ro? Uh Yes, if you have the the answer for that, please. So as far as, and please correct me if I misheard the question, but is the, will we be available to San Jose State? <clears throat> Yes, and I believe uh, Gil said MLK, which I, I'm assuming he meant uh, MLK Library. We are available to respond anywhere in the city if, if a call is made. Um, I know sometimes those calls come in particularly straight to us before they get to San Jose or, or San Jose State. And, and we're always available as a resource. So uh, whatever we can do to assist, um, we, we definitely will. And would that be a, a default though to to San Jose State uh, uh, UPD versus SJPD though, correct? You know what, uh, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll jump in, uh, Chairman. Uh, yes, uh, usually the calls, um, San Jose State has their own 911 center or communication, so they get the calls first, uh, they respond. And norm typically what happens is if they need any type of mutual aid or any assistance, uh, we get notified. And I think that's where um, Officer Centigli is mentioning is that we're available as a resource for San Jose State. Um, and I think at the library itself, I think part of it is, because um, it's complicated there, some of it's um, in, um, university uh, jurisdiction, some of it's ours. So uh, if it's ours, uh, we'll definitely be responding. Yeah, obviously there's a shared use there, right? It's on campus, but it's a public library. Um, and I know that UPD has the, uh, they have on-site security that that, um, that that works there. But my understanding is as well that there's some shared responsibility. So that is actually a, a good question and maybe something we could follow up with. I see, John, maybe you had an answer for that. I saw you raised your hand. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. And uh, I think Amy Hayes, our program manager from mobile crisis would want to uh, to chime in on this as well. For UPD, um, in my role as a liaison, by the way, I'm exclusively connected to San Jose PD and San Jose State PD. We put those together geographically. We have two other law enforcement liaisons that are connected as the primary contacts for the remainder of the law enforcement agencies throughout the county. San Jose PD represents about two thirds of our volume on the behavioral health mobile crisis side. And that's also true with my work as a liaison being the bridge between behavioral health, law enforcement on these problem solving efforts, raising the safety net so we can steer many of these cases to long-term sustainable mental health services as opposed to things bottoming out. So very close relationship with San Jose PD, obviously, but also with San Jose State PD, we have uh, provided them with uh, our facilitated crisis intervention training. Uh, we've actually provided our civilian version of crisis intervention training to just about the entire staff at MLK Library, as well as the rest of the libraries throughout the San Jose um, library system. So there's been a lot of collaboration and work that's been done together at that level. Uh, but our mobile crisis team, equally available to respond to any issues that our other law enforcement agencies uh, call us about, including from UPD. And Amy, maybe you can follow up on that point. Yeah, 
Yeah, thanks for that uh, segue to me, John. Um, so the county mobile crisis response team, we have a 1-800 number that's available for uh, you know any concerned citizen to call if they see someone experiencing a, an acute mental health crisis. Um, and we do respond and work very closely with the San Jose PD MCAT program, so mobile crisis assessment team, very close acronym. Um, and so, you know, if someone uh, was in a mental health crisis on San Jose uh, State University campus and they called our 1-800 number, we would make sure that we connected with the appropriate law enforcement team to be able to provide uh, an in-the-field mental health assessment. Um, so that's, that's sort of our goal. So when in doubt, any member of the community can call the 1-800 number with behavioral health and we'll track down whose jurisdiction it is and all that. And, um, and because we work so closely with San Jose PD's MCAT program, um, and, and the bulk, like John said, the bulk of our work is in San Jose, uh, we have navigated that pretty effectively so far. So any other questions about that, I'm happy to. Thank you. Yeah, uh, likely we'll have some more. And I'll go over to uh, Councilmember Mayhan now. Thanks, Chair, and thanks for the great report. I, I mostly just wanted to thank you all uh, for your efforts here. I think the um, both the MCAT pilot and, and, and then expansion that, that you went through and, and the traffic enforcement unit expansion are two, two things, two priorities I, I know my constituents will be very excited to hear an update on. So I just, I wanted to thank you for all your work there. And um, I guess as a, as a newer member of the council and the committee, you know, my, my questions may be somewhat um, simplistic, but did, did want to get a little more detail on a couple of things that came up. One was on car thefts, which um, my sense was that they've been increasing just even from what I'm hearing in the community. Um, I, I think the comment was made that the, the, um, the recovery data is indicating that the car is just being stolen for a ride, uh, uh, travel, travel within the city. But what, what does that really, what does that mean? Do we have a better sense? I know we're gonna, you're, you're gonna come back with more analysis, but um, is there any analysis you, you can give us at this point on why we think we're seeing the increase, why the cars are being stolen? The recovery rate seems pretty high. So what's, what's happening with these vehicles? So uh, council member Steve Doney from Research and Development, thank you for your question. Yes, we're seeing we're seeing a 93% recovery rate in 2020 for all the stolen vehicles. And that's primarily during you know the pandemic. And so what's happening is of the vehicles that were stolen in San Jose, 70% are being recovered still here in San Jose meaning they're being driven and we're either catching the driver in the vehicle driving here in San Jose, or they're dumping the vehicle and we're recovering it from, you know, where it's parked here in San Jose. So that's why we're getting that, that um, they're being used to be driven here within the city. Somebody's driving them around and then they're not being, you know, shipped out. Right. Does that, that makes sense? It does. Um, yeah. I, I, I guess I'm, I, I can wait for the deeper analysis. I guess I'm trying to understand the, 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 the motivation and, and try, just trying to better understand the issue. If, if the vehicle is, I don't know how quickly it's being recovered, but if it's being relatively quickly recovered within the city, uh, what is the value the, the thief is getting for stealing the vehicle? What is it? I, would, I would imagine, I would have thought that it would be sold somewhere in another city or something, but what's, what's actually happening there, do we think, or do we not know? It looks like the vehicles are either being used for transportation to and from a location that the, the person who's stealing it wants to drive, yeah. or maybe during the commission of another crime, yeah. and, and then recovered after that. I see. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, and I get. I it just it just it was it was an interesting data point to me. I, I would have expected more of them to have been taken out of the city and maybe sold or whatever somewhere else. So okay, thanks. That's I'll be looking forward to hearing more on that. And then. Um, Great to see the re the reductions on the um, on on the rape data, and this was also kind of quickly mentioned that the the intersectional pool is having an impact. And I guess just from a a learnings standpoint, I'm just curious if you can be a little more specific about what we're learning that is that we think is working. Are there particular things we've changed that we think are having the biggest impact, or or is it too soon to know? Uh, actually, yeah, thank you for the question. We have learned a lot from using the intersectionality tool. And for just to back up a little bit, I'll explain what that is. Um, 
in the early spring of last year, we implemented a new policy and procedure whereby domestic violence victims are being asked, uh, I'm sorry, domestic violence survivors are being asked uh, about any prior sexual assault, be it with their spouse or anybody. And there, this is based on the intersectionality between sexual assault and domestic violence. And so as a standard practice, when we go to any domestic violence call, we ask the survivor, have you ever been sexually assaulted by anybody? And we're finding a lot more reports are coming out. Um, and a lot of those, as you can see from the stats, are domestic violence sexual assaults, right? So spousal sexual assault or something like that. And so we're seeing this as becoming an incredibly effective tool on identifying incidents of sexual assault that we would otherwise not have been told about had we not asked about right. in where officers are responding to one type of call and they're adding this because of the the high prevalence of intersectionality to this that's why it's called the intersectionality tool and so um, since its inception we've seen a, a, a steady increase of uh, sexual assaults being reported so that's that's actually become an incredibly valuable tool yeah that makes a lot of sense and is, is really great to hear i'm i'm glad that, that that's so effective. Thanks for clarifying. I just wanted to make sure I, I actually understood what you meant by the intersectionality tool. So that's, that's great. Thank you. And then um, I think finally, let me just check. I took a few quick notes here. Um, and then I was curious. So I'm, I'm very um, excited about the MCAT program. I, I guess I wanted to understand. I imagine covering the whole city leads to a lot of travel time. And I'm curious if there's any insights there. Are we, is, is there any? Are there efficiencies we think we can gain? Is that an issue? Are we spending a lot of time? Is that unit spending a lot of time in just trying to get back and forth across the city? Or is that not so much of an issue? I'm, I'm just kind of curious what the experience of that has been. Uh, good question, sir. Uh, I, I would say it's not much of an issue. Uh, the patrol officers are used to it driving around. I think uh, the biggest challenge is, you know, getting everything done um, and getting those patrol officers uh, relieved if uh, for lack of better words, if they get out to this scene so we can get them back into service. Uh, but as far as the travel time, I don't think it's been an issue uh, for our team that's been out there. Right. Okay. That's good to hear. And what's the, or is there any efficiency picked up in terms of the composition of the unit that's responding to a call? Is it, is it fewer sworn officers with, with this um, model or, or is that, not the case. So efficiency. So it would have to look at how it used to be for uh, our partners. Uh, our, when we used to respond with our partners from the county, they would have to come out. They would have to make a phone call to our dispatchers who would then have to. James, I think hours. I can, while James is frozen, um, I can sort of chime in here. Uh, I think what he was saying, so before the MCAT program came out, um, there would be times when we would get a call from a member of the community and need to respond out, but there wouldn't be an available patrol unit. And so sometimes my staff would end up waiting hours before there was an available unit to send. So now, you know, we call James or we call Sergeant Porter and we go, hey, we've got this call that just came in. Can you meet us there? Um, and the mobile crisis response team, our average response time this year is 17 minutes. Anywhere in the county, it's not just San Jose, but anywhere in the county, our average response time is 17 minutes. Um, so being able to, to provide that service and not have to, to wait for an available unit has been uh, remarkable for our efficiency in San Jose. We've been really pleased with it. That's, all, that's what I was hoping to hear. That's fantastic. How does that 17 minutes compare to prior years? So uh, earlier, we were looking at over 30 minutes. Like 2019, wow. we were averaging around 32 minutes. 2020, it was uh, 20 minutes. And now we're down to 17 minutes with the, uh, the MCAT program. So it's been great. Great. That's fantastic. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate you all bearing with me with my, my basic questions. But um, excited by the report and, and really appreciate all the information. Yeah, thank you. And, and Matt, uh, I just thought of something, or uh, uh, Councilmember Mahan, sorry. Um, 
within this committee and the police department updates, uh, we as committee members have an opportunity to make requests on things that we might like to hear an update on. And that's how a lot of these have, have come forward. So uh, the newer members certainly feel free if there's certain things that you'd like to hear, you can bring them to the attention of uh, the police department um, during our committee meetings here, and then they can add them to agendas for future updates. Right, that's good to know. Thanks, Chair, appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, Councilman Redenest. Thank you. Um, I'm going to first uh, start with my with gratitude. Um, and this is for Chief Mata and Captain uh, Treyer uh, for their partnership in in making sure that there is um, an education um, campaign for our residents and outreach on, catal on the um, burglary of uh, catalytic converters. Um, I don't, well, theft of uh, uh, catalytic converters, and those are in hybrids, uh, hybrid cards. And um, in the last, I think it was maybe a month and a half ago, there was a resident in my district who was actually killed um, because he came out um, while there was a theft in process of his car, this catalytic converter that is underneath the car um and and uh, and he was shot um and so it's really important for our residents to understand um not to put themselves in harm's way and so i just want to thank you for for making that um that push uh, i had and, and personally there was um i also had a theft in, in the same month and i just think about it could have happened to anybody um, who just steps outside of their home in response to somebody uh, taking a piece of their car apart. And, um, and, and now this family doesn't have a father. Um, and, you know, there's a wife that is, is in mourning and children who are missing their dad. And so it, 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 um, it really just got to me because it, it, it is usually, I, I don't think these kinds of thefts end up um, with somebody losing their life. And so I really want to thank you for that. Thank you um, for, for making sure that we put um, this out there and just let folks know, let's leave that piece alone. Insurance can, we can recover those those pieces from for our car. We, we can't recover our health and our well-being. Um, and I know that this is a trend that was happening uh, not only last year or this year, but in, a, uh, in the last couple of years. And so, um, Captain Treyer, uh, you did a wonderful job. If you happen to be on, I think you were on earlier. Um, if you happen to be on, uh, thank you uh, for doing that work for us. Um, there was an extra patrol in our district um, because there was a number of, of thefts outside of just uh, the ones that I just mentioned to you. So thank you for that. Um, there is a question though in, in that, uh, I know you gave us a, an update about um, auto theft, and I'm guessing that this is, this catalytic, catalytic converter theft is, is considered personal property and not an uh, auto theft because the car isn't gone, it's just a piece of the car that's stolen, correct? Yes, ma'am, the, the stolen vehicles are just the vehicle themselves, and then a theft of a catalytic converter would be under theft or under our larceny statistics. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it 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 um certainly didn't I think come up for us in terms of of a trend because uh, very specific. Um, but with this the loss of life, I'm just astounded. Um, when uh, Captain Treyer gave us uh, the statistics and shared how how much of uh, this is happening in our city and just across really across the nation is what it's happening. So so thank you so much for for doing that. Um, I'm going to move on to our sexual assault strategy update. Um, one of the one of the, the questions that uh, Captain, uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> now I'm messing up everybody's titles. I'm supposed to. <laughs> I'm trying to talk about Councilmember Mayhan. <laughs> I'm calling him Captain now. <laughs> Everybody's a captain today. Thank it. <laughs> um, uh, you had a question about the intersectionality tool, and and uh, and I think that this is a great tool that is actually born out of the, some joint um, 
uh, efforts that we've had with the county. This this committee will meet at the end of the month on the 29th with, with the county once again to talk about sexual assault and the trends and some of the really great work that all of you, uh, many of you who are here today are they have been contributing and working really hard towards. And so I want to thank you all for that. Um, and, and specifically call out uh, uh, Captain Ta on that intersectionality tool because I believe it was a, a grant that he had written at that time and, um, and he was uh, our captain when we were having some of these meetings with, with the county. And so um, it's been very successful in terms of identifying additional um, crimes against survivors. And I'm hoping, and I, I don't see Lieutenant Jimenez, but I spoke with him about this um, I think, uh, Chief, I also had uh, spoken to you about, I think you were on the same call, in which I, I would really like to see this intersectionality tool not only just used for intimate partner violence, but also in sexual assault survivors um, to see the intersectionality of, of uh, domestic violence. And so that way we can help identify this is this this is the intersectionality, right? for for um, survivors of sexual assault that are typically survivors of domestic violence and vice versa. Um, and so uh, Chief Mata, I guess I, I'll, I'll ask you, cause I, I think it was you and uh, Lieutenant Jimenez in which I, we had this last conversation. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking that this is, could be something that could happen um, this year. Yes, council member, um, I believe uh, Lieutenant Jimenez is uh, working on that um, and uh, I'll follow up with him to uh, provide you with an update on that. Perfect, thank you. Uh, there was, uh, there's just so much success in, in asking some additional questions that I think it, it, we need to make sure that we, we cover all of our bases and, and the progress that you're all making is just extraordinary. Um, and so I appreciate that. Uh, the one piece that I was going to ask about is um, the RFP that has, I know it's it, it's implicit in the work plan that you all showed us. I think it's the 11 items that have been completed, six, six that are in progress, and the one that's outstanding. And this RFP um, is, is, uh, is something that was on our work plan, and it's meant to take a look at add uh, the trends in the city of San Jose so that we can better figure out what, what is happening. Um, but I think there was, a, there were, correct me if I'm wrong, either there was only one um, bidder on that RFP or there was no bidders on that RFP. Um, and I was talking to uh, 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 Supervisor Chavez in preparation for our meeting later on this month. And she took an interest in um, maybe joining forces with us and, and adding some resources to, to this RFP. And I'm hoping that I can get some feedback on that. Um, right now, the objective is to uh, document new and persistent challenges uh, uh, in the San, uh, the San Jose Police Department is facing and handling sexual assault cases, identify age groups and communities for targeted outreach and education programs understand how relationships between police victims and prosecutors are evol evolving over time with respect to responding to reports, examine the role of community characteristics to present stakeholders and develop data-driven decision with respect to San Jose distinct uh, diverse population. And lastly, identify best practices that are emerging in the handling of sexual assault cases with uh, trauma-informed uh, care. Um, and so I'm hoping, uh, Jennifer, that this is something that uh, my I'm guessing because nobody, there wasn't a lot of interest either because of uh, this is too much for the amount that we're offered or that, that's connected to the RFP, that there could be some opportunity. Um, uh, Chief Mata and Jennifer, I know that you're, you've been leading us with this work plan. So who, whomever uh, can answer this, that, but I hope that we can maybe put a bit of a pause until the end of the month, although I don't expect that there's um, a lot that can be done in between anyways, so that we can um, maybe explore the option of, of joining forces with uh, the county so we can actually make this happen. Um, yes, I, th I think that's a great idea because I know that the, from what I, uh, my last conversation with the police department is that they were looking at rescoping to maybe make that RFP more palatable and, and Chief Mata, maybe you can confirm that my understanding is correct. 
but I think we're, you know, always open to partnering and, and getting additional resources, if it, especially if there's a, you know, a joint interest in, the, in this information, which there certainly would be. So I think that uh, we certainly entertain something like that. Um, Chief Mata, do you want to add on to that? Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, no, you're absolutely right. Um, we we're always looking for, for partners um, with this, uh, this type of work. And uh, I believe, um, hopefully, it's on, um, on the agenda for the, at the end of the month so we can uh, also uh, continue those discussions uh, with the county. In general, there's some. Uh, oh, I'm so sorry, in general. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. I just think that, that yeah, I think that next uh, that meeting will be a good opportunity to discuss that partnership. So I Perfect. Appreciate bringing that up, Council Member. Perfect. Perfect. And, and listen, I look forward to this meeting because there's so much work in terms of uh, duty manual changes, standard operating practices, and procedures that have been established. Um, there's just so much work that our San Jose Police Department has produced in this arena that I'm just beaming with pride about sharing some of this with our partners. I mean, you know, there's always room for, for improvement in any uh, person and field, but I'm extremely proud of where we are. And I love that our, our new chief has a, a, a real commitment, um, I, I like our former chief did as well, but, uh, and that you've, you know, you've shared your commitment to this um, area. And so I really am I'm grateful to all of you um, on this. Um, so I'm gonna move um, on other than just to say, um, uh, I think in the in this week's in this week's uh, council meeting we had um, a bit of a, a difference of opinion in terms of what to put on that um, resource card for victims, and I can't remember what the section number is. Um, and this was a suggestion that what came out of the mayor's office. I actually took it off my memo, but I heard Angeli say that it was already integrated into the card, and so I want to make sure that we retract it. Um, because our stakeholders said that that was not something that we should place on um, a resource or a bill of rights resource card. So I just want to confirm that we're all on the same page and we're not going to place that on the resource card, correct? Yes, that's my understanding. Yeah. I'm Go, ahead, sorry, Steve. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, uh, DC Washburn raised her hand, so it's just calling her. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, Councilmember Arenas. I, I was monitoring the council meeting and it is my understanding that I, I do believe that is still in process and that there is um, there is an opportunity. I, I don't think that the language is firm and, and already being going to print. I think we still have some time and it's my understanding that there is going to be some recommendations maybe um, for that language and that there is still time to review that before making anything final. I, I can verify that with um, Lieutenant Lang in the Family Violence Unit, but that was my understanding on Tuesday. Wonderful. And I did make a commitment to the mayor to maybe identify another part of the process in which a survivor uh, goes through or in, in, whether it's in the D when that survive or that case for the survivor is in the DA's office or some somewhere else in the uh, in a different point of the process. Uh, to actually share some of that information. I just didn't think uh, it was appropriate when I uh, got some of the calls from the stakeholders. I, you know, it just created some awareness uh, on my end on, um, on making sure that this was very victim-centered um, and that we gave uh, uh, survivors uh, uh, the, the, the information that allowed for them to feel uh, that they had agency. Um, so anyways, uh, so th thank you so much. Um, and then lastly, I just wanna make sure that we have Nextdoor um, moving forward with Nextdoor on MOUs. Uh, this was part of the conversation that we had earlier this month. Um, it's so important now that we have um, this in intersectionality tool um, with intimate partner violence and they're one of the major agencies that offer that very specific service to survivors. Um, is that something that is also uh, being worked on? Council member, thank you for your question. Yes, that's actually part of the process that Lieutenant Jimenez is going through now. I met with him about this yesterday, both the, your prior question about um, the verbiage on the card, which was has not been implemented. I can verify what 
DC Washburn was saying, it, it's still working through the process because it's a county based card. It's going to take some time to be presented to the county partners and then the decision on what's going to happen. Um, so there's still time on that. As far as the um, next door solutions, we are moving forward with developing an MOU with them based on the needs of uh, the department and the survivors. Perfect, perfect, perfect. I think the more uh, uh, partners that we have, the, the, the better outcomes we have for our survivors. And lastly, I just wanna um, say thank you to our chair uh, because you actually helped us get the uh, Sexual Assault Bill of Rights to move forward and not to get hung up in priority uh, settings. So thank you so much, uh, Chair, for, for doing that. Um, and this is, a, this is one of the reasons why we can talk about this today. So, so thank you. You're welcome, uh, and, and thank you, obviously, for your leadership on there. Um, I was merely trying to be creative to, to minimize that list for, for all of us, and, and it worked. Um, and uh, and thank you as well. I think Council Member Arenas is, is creating what hopefully will be utilized more often with not just this committee, but with other committees, which is joint meetings with the county. I know that's not something that the county can do with every single city, but uh, being that the city of San Jose is over half the population of the county. And as we've heard today, when it comes to certain calls, especially like this crisis uh, calls, uh, we're well more than half of, of the incidents that affect the county. And so it really, I think, is beneficial to both um, organizations uh, to, to be able to meet together more frequently. And we're, we're doing that, as Council Member Dennis pointed out, through her leadership. Um, and, and I think that that, again, this is something that maybe we might want to look at with other committees and other issues, like we know, for instance, regarding homelessness, right, and, 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 and issues that, that would be beneficial to, to continue to have some joint meetings. It's tough to get the entire council and the entire board together, um, and maybe a little easier on the, the committee level. So thank you for your leadership on that, uh, Council Member Dennis. Uh, th thank you, uh, Chair. And uh, with that, I, I would like to uh, make a motion to accept the report. And I believe uh, I heard earlier, either it was from you or our council member Mayhan to maybe bring back uh, the MCAT uh, for uh, a, an additional report in terms of how uh, this is progressing as it's carried on. Take that motion. And is that correct, correct uh, Councilor Mayhan? Ideally, sure. Yeah, I would love that. And, and I'll second. Yeah, Thanks. Yeah. Great. We'll give the second to Councilor Mahan, and then I'll hand it over to uh, Council Member Jimenez. Yeah, thank you. I uh, appreciate the report. Uh, a lot of good questions. Wonderful to see a lot of uh, familiar faces in different roles. <laughs> um, I just had a few questions. Uh, the, the first question is sort of tied to what uh, Council Member Mahan was mentioning or asking about uh, the stolen vehicles. I guess. You know, I recall seeing this report, I'm not sure where it was published, but I think it happens every so often where they publish the most frequently stolen vehicles and things of that nature. And so I'm curious if there are any sort of notable sort of uh, facts or tidbits of information that have come from some of the stolen vehicles uh, of things, trends we're seeing in the community that you think would be worthwhile in sharing with the, with the community. Council member, thank you for your question. Um, we did not, before this meeting, look into what types of vehicles were stolen or are uh, the, the most common, commonly stolen vehicles. I can absolutely get you that information and send it to your office this week. Yeah, yeah, certainly nothing pressing. I was just, you know, to the extent it can be a, a brief two-second mention next time we get a report. I think it'd just be interesting to see that. Uh, obviously, uh, with, uh, I know Council Member Arenas was mentioning some of the uh, issues as uh, folks are having with the Priuses and things of that nature. And so uh, I know that's prevalent these days, but I think it'd be good information to have and, and to the extent we can put some information out to the community uh, so they can keep an eye out. Nope. I think it'd be good. No problem, I'll get that for you and send it to your office. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, the other question I had is about the intersectionality tool. Obviously a good thing to have, what, what I'm curious about and what it seems to me is that the, the ideal situation would be, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, and this go, goes to you, uh, to you, Mr. Donahue, but, uh, or, or anyone else that can answer it, but uh, officers go out there, they ask these questions, they figure out there is some intersectionality. So there have been other incidents of, you know, sexual assault, domestic violence, whatever it may be. Uh, the ideal situation, is it correct to assume that that would then lead to additional police work, like actionable sort of investigations into other matters? Is that, is that safe to say? Thank you, sir, yes. Um what ends up happening if if the 
survivor is presenting a, an incident that occurred prior and is not congruent with the incident that they're investigating that day. So for example, if, if the survivor's uh, reporting a domestic violence from today and during the questioning and the, the interview says a year ago something occurred, that officer is going to create two reports. The first report is the domestic violence report and the second report is going to be that sexual assault report. And then the sexual assault report gets routed to the detectives in the sexual assault investigations unit and they conduct the investigation on that. And then the domestic violence gets conducted by the domestic violence unit because they are historical. If the two incidents are congruent and they were part of a series of events that occurred at, at that acute time, then they will all be investigated together at that one time through one case. Okay, so if an officer is there and they're investigating the sexual assault, the man or woman says, I was sexually assaulted by a total different person a year ago, that would stay within the sexual assault unit, it would just be a totally different case, right? Because it's not necessarily tied to that one incident that they're responding to, is that correct? That's, that's correct, yes. Oh, okay. So, so the reason I'm asking this is, and that's what I sensed, uh, which is obviously a good thing. What I'm curious about is, do we keep track and is there a way to monitor how much actionable sort of cases come out or emanate from some of that additional work, right? So for example, um, you know, we, we, we use this for say a year or two. Uh, do we know how many additional cases were generated uh, because of that? And then how many of those were actually, you know, sent to the DA and then prosecuted, right? Because ha having been an investigator at the public defender's office in the past, I know that sometimes, uh, these cases are very difficult to prove. Sometimes we're going back several years when, you know, someone's, I mean, a host of things can come into play, right? That, but, but they're t sometimes challenging to find physical evidence, sometimes just based on memory and such. So I'm curious if we have any information as it relates to how, how common that is that we actually uh, sort of uh, work on a case and, and forward it to the prosecutor's office and something gets done. And it may be early so, on in, the pro in this whole process, so maybe we're not there yet. But if we're not, I think it maybe you'd love to get your opinion if you think that's a worthwhile sort of thing to track. It's something that I think we might be able to data mine based on the template that's used in order to determine whether or not the intersectionality uh, tool was exercised in the investigation. I would have to get back to you on whether or not that essentially that checkbox is related then to another case. Um, I can tell you when we do check that box and then another case is generated, they link the two case numbers. So data mining that, I, I would have to look at it and get back to you on that. But I do know that we do have all the data on what cases are investigated, what cases are prosecuted, how many are filed by the DA's office, all, the, all those numbers. Yeah, and the, one of the reasons I ask is that obviously it's a success in all our minds, I imagine, that someone is willingly sharing another incident, right? That, and really coming forward, obviously that takes a lot of courage and such. But I imagine that the real success comes in making sure that the people that did, the person or people that did and perpetrated the crime were brought to justice, right? And so um, I almost feel like if, if, if some of the crime is disclosed, that's just but one step in the process, right? And I'm curious, I think it's worthwhile to figure out if we're taking that extra step and actually being successful in prosecuting some of these folks. I do know, council member, that every sexual assault case where we're able to develop a, a suspect and a, uh, a survivor in which we can substantiate probable cause that an event occurred, every one of those is sent to the district attorney's office for filing. Whether or not they files up to the district attorney's office based on the criteria in which they look at the case, um, which is a little different lens than we use. But mm -hmm. I know that every sexual assault is sent there when probable cause is established. Okay, all right, okay. Well, listen, uh, to the extent other folks see value in sort of mining this out, you know, um, shaking this out a little bit to see if it's, anything of value or what it tells us, right? I mean, we can make a lot of extrapolations as to what that tells us, but I think it's a worthwhile thing to, to look into. But thank you for, for the report, appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And before I turn it over to our vice mayor, I know we have some attendees here to speak on the last item. 
So after we get done with this item, I will be asking the committee to accept taking out of order the last item. Uh, so just making note to the members of the public that are here waiting on that. And and sorry, Captain uh, Staley, I believe we'll, we'll be pushing yours uh, last. So, but um, we'll now turn it over to Vice Mayor Jones. Thank you, Chair. I just have a quick, easy question. Uh, for the traffic enforcement unit, uh, we have 14 uh, personnel responsible for uh, a city of a million people with all the additional uh, responsibilities that they have. So my, my question is, uh, what is the adequate staffing level that we need to really um, meet the needs of uh, the city in terms of traffic enforcement? A nice softball question for you. Well, uh, that's obviously the million dollar question, I think, um, with us and any other large city in the country. I think we always look at that balance to strive um, what we can do to put officers on the street um, and obviously have that balance with staffing as to what we put into patrol, what we put into investigations, what we put into special operations. So with with what we have now assigned to the police department, I think we're, we're hovering at a reasonable level based on our current staffing model department wide. Um, however, you know, in years ago, and, and we're only going back about six years or so, we had a traffic enforcement unit that consisted of about 50 officers. So, um, you know, we diminished over the years as a result of staffing and budget cuts and things of that nature. We got down to about four officers and one sergeant, and we started that rebuilding process here about a year and a half, two years ago, and now we're starting to see our staffing climb to where we are today. So, um, you know, that's, that's, a, that's obviously a multifaceted question, but I think we're on the right track. And I think that as we continue to grow as a department, um, Chief Mata and, uh, and uh, the rest of the organization, we can determine how many we can add and how we can continue to grow uh, to the level we need to. So um, what you're telling me then is maybe that 50 number would probably be closer to what we should strive for versus where we are right now. Would that be taking a leap? Certainly, I think as we climb and as we've grown in population over the years, we're at a million, a million one, probably in the city. Uh, I certainly would think that 50 would be a reasonable number. That certainly wouldn't be over the top numbers at all to, to do effective traffic enforcement in the city of this size. Great, thank you. That's it, uh, Chair. Thank you. Oh, I saw the chief unmute, but but we'll just stick with uh, what Lieutenant I had said. <laughs> um, and so uh, just a couple of things for, from me as well, and I'll kind of go down through uh, in order. First off, thank you. This was a very detailed uh, presentation, a lot packed into it and a lot of important stuff. Um, in regards to the, the stolen vehicles, I wanted to see if there's any uh, identified trends as uh, that regard. And I think Councilmember Jimenez touched on it as well in regards to the types of vehicles, but really looking for anything that we may be able to share with our community, uh, especially maybe in collaboration with crime prevention um, to, to see if we, we can't help them better protect themselves and their vehicles. Thank you, Councilmember. Um, yes, we're looking at the trends and patterns right now and trying to decipher um, the most effective way to message that to the community. And um, hopefully in a very short period of time, we'll have that information for you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and if you can share that with uh, likely all the council members, I think everybody would, would appreciate that. Um, and uh, spoke a little bit about uh, uh, the meeting we'll be having uh, at the end of the month. And again, thank you to Council Member Dennis for, for your leadership on that and, and appreciate the PD responding back on the Sexual Assault Bill of Rights here. Um, in regards to the redistricting, uh, you put through the phases and, and denoted, obviously, we're in the, the first phase here, phase one. There's no uh, timeline there. It just shows the phases. And I know we've talked about this before, that the timeline is kind of hard to predict because once we get into it, um, depending on how large the scope of, of the changes need to be, uh, the timeline can change. But I have seen in the past uh, timeline maps that, that sort of show some vaguety, right? They, they, they'll, they'll show up, you know, six month span of for a certain section that's not really known if it's going to take a month, two months or six months. And it sort of just allows that map out for us to see almost a worst case scenario, but a best case scenario. And that's what I would like to see so we can 
uh, be able to report that back as well to our community members on when we think this process will be done. I think there's a lot of things tied to this process that I certainly have been interested in. And so I wanna be able to, to give some, I think visual assurance to our community members that there's some timeline attached to that. What's the possibility of, of, of getting that? Council member, we can absolutely do that. Would it be all right if I added that to the next bi-monthly so that it's in part of the presentation that I'm gonna be doing on the, the um, redistricting? Yes, yeah, thank you. Great, no problem, I can add that. Thank you. And um, no comments, but thank you again for the update on the, the, the crime uh, hotspots, Mayor's Game Prevention Task Force hotspots, um, and looking forward to getting back uh, to meeting with the Mayor's Game Prevention Task Force. That's a meeting that has been really postponed through the pandemic, so we're going to be getting back to that uh, next month, and so looking forward uh, to that. Um, and then clearly uh, supportive in regards to the efforts with TEU. Um, I think no surprise, uh, something I have been, been arguing for, for for some time, and um, and we've been looking at that data in regards to really how um, low we dropped in our staffing within TEU. And um, I'm a, a big proponent of uh, both the, the infrastructure changes we can do with, with regards to traffic calming, but uh, no matter what we put in place, we know there's individuals out there that are going to break the law. They're going to run stop signs. They're going to cross over medians or barriers, fly through and over speed bumps. Uh, you know, uh, the sideshow issue, obviously, that we, that we have going on. Uh, and even independently from sideshows, people doing donuts in the middle of intersections and whatnot. And, uh, and so it, traffic calming measures are not going to solve the, the complete issue that we have and that our community members have um, with uh, the, the incidents within our street and, and vehicle collisions because of that. And so the enforcement has to be a, a component alongside of that. And as Lieutenant and I have pointed out uh, with a city over a million, there's no way that we're adequately staffed when it comes to our traffic enfor enforcement. We know that's the case with our entire police department though. So that, that, you know, I don't think that there, it's not an easy, uh, obviously decision that our chief has to make. Um, and uh, at the same time, I think, uh, we need to keep relaying what we're hearing from our community members and it's uh, as of late obviously been raised in regards to the sideshow issue but even outside of that we know that we we still need to beef up the the traffic enforcement unit so it, i'm excited to see that and lieutenant and i just to confirm you you stated that um you're thinking by the end of summer we'll be able to, to go to this new model of, of of the two teams yeah, with training and some of the things we have to put into place to make that change, uh, I would I would say that mid summer, mid to end of summer is a reasonable expectation to get that that implemented to the two team model. Okay, and then I just ask that that um, obviously keep us updated as as that happens. We'd love to hear at this committee once the two teams are fully functional. Perfect, we'll do. Thank you. And then appreciate the uh, the further update on the mobile crisis. A uh, mobile crisis assessment team, and certainly something that I think uh, can be extremely beneficial, and uh, one of those crossover uh, responsibilities again between the city and the county. And uh, so appreciate having um, all partners here at uh, at today's meeting. The staffing model uh, that was displayed on the the, sc the screen talked about the the PD staffing model. I have a couple of questions there, but then also was curious about on the county side. So we denoted um, obviously the growth from the pilot, which was great. Two sergeants, eight officers, seven days a week, and ten hours per day. And so that's the 10 a.m. till 8 p.m. What happens outside of those hours? A good question there, sir. Uh, hopefully you can hear me now and I'm not frozen. Apologies for that earlier. Yes, uh, yeah, we, we have you now. Very good. And and I'm, I hope the uh, county partners are still logged on here because they can probably um, add better clarity to that question. But after hours, generally speaking, uh, if mobile crisis from the county is needed, then our patrol teams would call and request their assistance. So, and Amy, if you're still there, maybe you can jump in and answer that a little, uh, again, with a little more clarity. Yeah, uh, happy to take that question. And, and uh, yes. If you can add to it, my other part for question for you was, uh, 
what was not in the slideshow was the staffing model on, on your end, on the county's end. So kind of just curious what that looks like as well. Sure. The county mobile crisis response team um, has 11 full-time clinicians uh, for the whole county. Uh, they are on the phones, answering incoming calls and responding in the field, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday. Outside of those hours, we have voluntary on-call staff who will respond um, uh, with limited capacity. So the 11 full-time is that Monday through Friday, 8 to 8. Outside of those hours, we will still respond. It's just um, voluntary on-call staff. And so both the on the obviously police officers end of it and on the county end, uh, we have really diminished services after 8 p.m. and all the way up until 8 a.m. Is that that's correct to say? Yes, yes but something we do do, uh, council member, is when we do encounter people with a crisis in the late evening hours, we have developed an internal process where, where the sergeants and our officers know that they're to provide some specific information to the MCAT team, and they have their casework in the morning. So when they come in, uh, the MCAT sergeants, they go through their emails, they'll, they'll conduct follow-up on some of these incidences that occurred the previous night, and the, the, they've also been very successful there where they've reestablished contact when things have calmed, and then they've leveraged the clinicians at that point as well. Thank you. And I'm, I'm going to paint a hypothetical picture here and then ask a question. Uh, and this is something that we hear from community and I think we, we know is, is, is a potential uh, as well. Um, outside of these hours, so, you know, two in the morning, say, um, you get a call and it goes south and somebody experiencing a mental health crisis ends up getting killed by a police officer. And our community comes back and says, why didn't we have the same level of service 24-7 uh, as we do, say, at 2 p.m.? And, and I, so my question back, right, because I, I agree with that. Uh, and quite frankly, right, I, I worked uh, my eight years on the police department uh, every year was on the graveyard shift. And, uh, and this was one of our biggest, uh, I think, complaints is, is not being able to have the same resources that uh, that officers had during the day, especially when it came to incidents like this, where there was maybe outside resources outside of the police department uh, that we could not tap into as as um, as easily as day shift officers could. So the question is, knowing you know sort of that idea and that hypothetical, what are the plans to actually expand these services beyond those hours to make this more of a twenty four seven Availability type of service, but with the with you know with the, with at least comparable um, availability. I know I know it, it it exists right again. There's officers working clearly 24 seven, as you pointed out, Amy. Uh, there's there's clearly some resources that can be tapped into, uh, but it's and by no means is it comparable. So what I'm curious about is, are there plans to try and and boost that up uh, on both ends? So both from the county's end, and then I'm curious as well from from SJPD's end. And again, I know this is brand new as well in SJPD's part, but but that's the question for both. Yes, I think we would love to be able to expand what we do on a 24/7 basis, but I think we run into the same circumstances that we have with our traffic unit, where you know with the current staffing model, we just can't do that. Even right now, we have our resources on a temporary basis because we don't have that, you know, that extra staffing to assign officers permanently to that detail. And we're operating under funding where it's temporary funding. But uh, I think that is what we envision is that, you know, we can operate, you know, 24 7. And that's something that we'll have to continue to tweak the current hours, right? If, with our studies and research, if we learn that you know, a lot of these crisis incidences are later, we might have to uh, shift our model to cover those high demand times and then have another seat at the table when we try to have more resources. I also want to jump in real quick and say, so our, our staffing with the County Behavioral Health Program is based around when uh, we receive the bulk of our call volume. And the data shows that most of our calls do come in between, uh, sometime between 8 and 9 a.m. through 8 and 9 p.m. That's generally when we see the biggest volume of calls. 
Um, but, but that being said, about a third of our call volume does come in after hours and on weekends, and we still respond. Um, it does uh, tax the staffing levels to be able to respond, and that's something that, you know, I, as the program manager, am, am very invested in um, expanding my program's ability to respond, especially after hours and on weekends. Um, so I can't speak to what the long-term plans are from the, you know, the director level at the county, um, but that's, uh, we, like I said, a third of our calls coming in after hours, um, it, but we are able to respond. So law enforcement can call on us um, to alleviate these things, like in the example of, you know, two o'clock in the morning asking why mobile crisis wasn't called, you can call us at 2 a.m. Um, and it might be me that ends up going out um, if I don't have enough staff with two calls come in at the same time, but we are dedicated to being able to provide 24 seven services. Yeah, thank you. I've actually been on a number of calls with John Costa. So uh, I know that you will come out and those, those calls were at, you know, in the middle of the night. Um, but it obviously not as, as uh, robust, right. In regards to the, the availability and my understanding from Bayview health services and not to speak for the director, but that one of the challenges is being able to hire people to work that that graveyard or overnight shift, right? And, um, you know, SJPD, you don't really have a, uh, you know, an, an option, right? It's a 24 seven role and everybody knows that coming into it, but behavioral health services, that's not the case. And so, um, and would you agree that that's, that's been one of the challenges? I have never had the uh, opportunity to attempt to hire someone for the, you know, midnight to 8 a.m. shift, for example. Um, I know that it can, it's tricky to staff it with on-call folks right now because the on-call staff are currently working in some other full-time capacity within the county. So they may be working, you know, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. at a second at their primary job and then, and then filling in on-call for us. So that gets a little tricky. Um, but I'm, I'm fairly confident that uh, we have the ability to find dedicated clinicians who are really cut out for crisis work um, that uh, would have the capacity bandwidth and interest in working even off off hours. Okay, that's positive to know. Thank you. And then uh, in regards to the, the presentation, um, what was uh, displayed was the, the program comparisons of uh, the MCAT uh, and then the program displayed as cahoots, which talks about um, the team of two responding, which would be a medic and a mental health crisis counselor. And I understand that, that, that that's not the model that we have. Is that a direction that we're looking at also um, going or trying to add something uh, like that where it's not even a police officer responding in partnership? Is that somewhere where we're looking to go? Or, or does that even happen today potentially where you know somebody can, can just get a uh, um, mental health professional to, to respond out without a police officer? I can uh, take this one. So the, the county does have uh, an MHSA grant for an innovation project that will involve, um, it's called community mobile response, and that will be um, they're looking at it and, and receiving community feedback on exactly how it's going to look, um, but they're looking into having some sort of a medical professional, whether it's an LVN, a psych tech, possibly an EMT, going out with um, a paraprofessional like a KDAC or a rehabilitation counselor without law enforcement to some of these, um, what in mobile crisis we would call non-urgents, um, and, and doing um, assessment, evaluation, and referral, which that seems significantly more similar to the CAHOOTS model than, than what Mobile Crisis or, or MCAT is doing. But we don't have that today, you're saying? No. So what would happen today? I actually had a constituent asking me saying, hey, if I, you know, uh, if I personally am, am, am wanting to request uh, help, uh, Mobile Crisis help, can I request that an officer does not respond, right? How do I, how do I get just half of the response team right now? Is that possible? Do we have something like that? So about 96% of mobile crisis response teams calls, we go out with law enforcement. And that 4% is when we're responding to usually some sort of a facility like a hospital where they have their own um, security or other staffing for that. Um, and, and we do get that question really frequently. Um, you know, can, I don't want law enforcement there or, um, you know, this person saying that they'll, you know, attempt suicide by cop or something like that. Um, and, and so my staff are pretty savvy at being able to navigate that, um, but there isn't an option right now because 
um, for the safety of my staff and, and the safety of the scene, we really need to respond with law enforcement to make sure that none of these situations um, go sideways. And so with this CAHOOTS model, if we did, and it sounds like there may be this innovation grant where the, the county's going to look at something like that, there wouldn't be an officer there. So is it safe to assume that it's, it, it obviously is a very select type of call, right, that, that you would be utilizing that model for? And do you, yeah. The, the CAHOOTS model, generally speaking, and, and I think that um, Officer Cernelia had this in his, his um, presentation, it, they respond to, to calls where there's no history of violence, no indication of like weapons or drugs or crime in progress or anything like that. So it is, um, it is a more selective process. The mobile crisis response team as it currently exists and MCAT additionally will respond to, um, you know, the whole spectrum, whether it's someone who's gravely disabled or someone who, you know, has a weapon and is holding a hostage. It's a pretty broad spectrum of response. Um, CAHOOTS is much more narrow. Do you think that it would be larger than say the four or five percent or so than, than what you're seeing today? Is it, would there be a higher percentage actually that could qualify for whatever this new model, whatever we're gonna call it here, that would be similar to CAHOOTS? Sure, I think that um, the being able to screen those calls and the way the CAHOOTS model does it is through dispatch, right? Like the call comes into 911, the 911 dispatcher can, can sort of run their, the history on that client or location to figure out if there's a history of violence or criminal issue. Um, and uh, right now, the calls come in to you know, the County Behavioral Health, it's a 1-800 number staffed with clinicians who are answering the phones. Um, or the, you know, if the call's coming through law enforcement, we get more of that background information. But if it's coming to us, we're not screening for that. It, the, and with the community mobile response, I'm not exactly sure the logistics of how that will work and whether or not they will be able to screen those calls out um, for history of violence or other concerns like that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. And, and I, I, I look forward to hearing more about um, that model. So I think as we, we get another update, I would love to, to, to learn a little bit more about that. I don't know if you would be available to, to join again, or there would be somebody else that could give us an update on uh, the county's efforts in that regard. Um, I think it's great what we're doing on our end because a lot of these calls, as we know, I think the majority are gonna continue to be responded to with police officers and maybe even initially by police officers only. And, um, and so I think it's important what we're doing with MCAT and we need to continue that. Uh, but at the same time, and part of what we're looking at in regards to reimagining public safety is, is how do you actually get other professionals to, to, to attend to some of these calls and, and not necessarily always rely on a police response. And so I look forward to, to hearing that update. And uh, thank you as well to Officer Cenelia for, for your efforts in this regard to, to get that pilot uh, funded and rolling. And you should be proud of your efforts on, on now the fact that we've been able to roll this into a, an, ongoing, um, an ongoing unit within the police department. So thank you for your efforts on that. So let me uh, go back to the slide here just to see if that was the end of my questions. That was, okay. So uh, we have a motion and a second. If we can get a roll call vote, please. Arenas? Yes. Jones? Jones? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jimenez? Aye. Perales? Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if the committee is, is fine with it, as I had mentioned earlier, I would like to call an item out of order here. Um, the first item uh, I should have known, but it took a little bit longer. And so item D3, I know we have some uh, community members that would like to speak to that. So uh, if my colleagues um, are comfortable, I'd like to call item D3. And I'll ask the uh, city manager's office, do we need to make a, a vote on that to change the order or, or can we just call D3 out of order? I want to actually ask Rosa. She's there. Are there yes, uh, I'm here, Jennifer. Yeah, there you are. Um, let's j just be conservative and let's just vote on that. And... Sounds good. Thank you. So, if we can get a motion to call item D3 uh, out of so order. So moved. Second. And a roll call vote, please. Arenas? Yes. Jones? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jimenez? Aye. Corrales? Aye. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And so we will now call item uh, D3, the fireworks ordinance work plan status report. And I would like to welcome, we also have a new face 
from, uh, well, at least to this committee, from the fire department, our new assistant fire chief, James Williams. Uh, so congratulations. So a lot of new uh, faces here at our uh, PISFIS committee. So a welcome assistant chief. Thank you so much. I'm honored to uh, be here with the city of San Jose serving this community. And I look forward to working with all of you in the community for uh, years to come. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, I'm Deputy Chief Actor Estrada. Just let me confirm that you can see the full screen uh, for the presentation first slide. Yes. Great. So uh, um, I'd like to thank the, the chair and the committee for this opportunity to deliver the fireworks ordinance work plan status update. And um, I am Deputy Chief Hector Estrada and with the fire department and also presenting will be Captain Jason Ta of the San Jose Police Department uh, Support Services Division. This presentation covers the preparation and actions in response to the 2021 New Year and Lunar New Year Tet celebration. And it's the status report for the assigned tasks that we have, um, we had in queue and those that we received on October 27th of 2020 uh, by council. The 2021 fireworks ordinance work plan status report dated April 6th is available on the city of San Jose website via a link um, on the city council agenda. So I'd like to start by reviewing our program components and the goals for the effort to reduce the use of illegal fireworks first. Um, the program components remain education and our outreach, which is essentially awareness. Uh, this is where we attempt to reach as many people as possible through the multimedia with uh, relevant messages in the appropriate languages. Our second component is reporting, and this is how we, uh, we have, or, uh, have an effort to improve the data quality and uh, increase the ease in reporting while increasing actionable reports that result in either citation or warnings. Uh, enforcement is the third component and uh, through most of the recent reporting periods, this has been the uh, most challenging as it has been for other cities across the nation. Uh, to review the goals that we have, uh, primarily to reduce injuries and fires uh, caused by illegal fireworks use, decrease uh, illegal fireworks activity, and uh, increase the number of actionable reports. And most recently, as a result of a new change from our local ordinance, uh, increase awareness of uh, fines for illegal fireworks activity. It's been a, a pretty busy six months for us as, as in the group. And uh, in that six months, we have uh, presented to council twice. That was first October and then in December, uh, we've completed a, a number of work plan items and uh, we've Thanks for doing that. working on uh, our interdepartmental and interagency collaboration. So our group has met regularly uh, with the city technology uh, or IT department, uh, city attorney's office, office administration, policy, and intergovernmental relations, as well as other outside entities have been part of this, this collaboration. Uh, we've explored uh, the options that we have and the, the feasibility for online reporting uh, integration with the uh, city uh, information technology department. We've expanded our campaign messaging and uh, we have now provided a new year and lunar new year education and outreach. And uh, we have uh, been restored to the uh, public safety finance and strategic support uh, and city council agenda. So that brings us here today and we'll be reporting up to uh, council on the fourth. So a summary of some of the items that we've completed uh, in the last few months, uh, we uh, have um, at direction from council researched fines and uh, we provided recommendation to council which resulted in the increase of those fines for administrative citations. Our uh, fines have gone for the first violation from 500 to 1000. For a second violation within 18 months, we will uh, now from 700 to $2,000. The third violation within 18 months, 1,000 to 3,000. Um, so these uh, were in effect for the new year and they were uh, accepted on the 15th of December, like I said. Uh, the presentation to council for the di digital strategy roadmap was uh, San Jose 311 report was provided by uh, city IT department and uh, where 
uh, a clear assessment of the integration possibilities and identify and, and we identified um, key metrics to, uh, in order to uh, look at the feasibility of incorporating the online reporting tool into uh, potentially 311. But essentially, we've uh, identified some uh, our current priorities for making uh, enhancements to the tool. We looked at the uh, um, evaluation and funding for hotspots. This is an area where Captain Todd will be talking uh, specifically about a little later in the presentation, and uh, they'll be relevant for the hotspot enforcement for the 2021 4th of July uh, reporting period. So I'd like to briefly talk about the uh, reporting period that uh, just passed for the, the new year. It lasted 53 days. It spanned from December 23rd to February 14th. Uh, and through the online reporting tool, we took in 342 reports, uh, 21 of which were actionable. And uh, that puts us at about 6%, which although it was modest, it was a brief uh, uh, improvement from 5%. Um, so still work to be done there. But uh, it's summed up 20 warnings in one citation. Uh, and so court, code enforcement staff, evaluated and followed up with all of the reporting uh, parties that had uh, actionable items that were resulting in warnings or citations. For fire calls uh, that were tagged as uh, related to fireworks or that were possibly related to fireworks, there were 16 in that period, uh, which resulted in zero fires and um, that was neither in structures or vegetation. There was one event that uh, was classified as a medical emergency. And, uh, but a, more, a majority of the calls that were uh, reported were to report on conditions, which is essentially things like uh, smoke in the area, loud noise, things like that. Uh, our fireworks hotline, 301 uh, phone reports, we took in 113 calls and 56 of those were routed to the online reporting tool. Uh, 23 were answered by San Jose 311 center staff and 34 were forwarded to the after hours answering service. And uh, finally, we, we had an opportunity to have a little bit more targeted outreach in different languages. So in addition, we had a, an extra 110,000 uh, 110, people that were reached through a focused and uh, they were a focused uh, targeting campaign in, um, in specific languages. So I'd like to highlight that for a second because uh, this is a new addition to the, the outreach library that we have. So Members of the fire department and fire prevention were featured in new videos. Uh, multilingual education videos were expanded to include new content for the Lunar New Year and New Year. And uh, we uh, produced those videos in English, Spanish, Vietnamese, and Chinese. So I'd like to have a brief overview of some of the things that were completed and where we are now. Things that were um, that were recently achieved: the uh, increased fireworks fines that were effective on December fifteenth. Uh, as a result of that comparative analysis and council direction and acceptance, um, San Jose now has some of the highest uh, penalties, financial penalties, in the form of fines for illegal fireworks use. Our campaign visibility to our multilingual audiences. Now that we have a, uh, our public service announcement video library it has been expanded we can reach a greater number of our citizens in languages in which they feel most comfortable. Uh, targeted social media will be combined with that and we will focus on areas and continue to focus on areas that have a higher history of the uh, use of illegal fireworks. And now they can be reached in multiple languages that fit the demographic of those neighborhoods. So uh, we, all, we will continue to maintain the uh, outreach library and the language uh, diversity that we have. Uh, and uh, we were able to take advantage of one opportunity that uh, we hadn't before, and we were, we were able to uh, conduct an interview or have an inter be interviewed by uh, Channel 26 KTSF in uh, Chinese, and that was with uh, reporter Vivian Wang. So we'll continue to look forward or look for opportunities uh, of this type, and we'll uh, see if we can get that additional assistance in carrying our message. So, and then the uh, expanded uh, campaign uh, for our uh, stakeholder outreach. So the partnerships that we have with uh, different groups, uh, our fireworks messaging toolkit, once again, were distributed throughout uh, multiple stakeholder groups uh, through city council, school districts, neighborhood commissions, neighborhood associations and residents uh, belonging to the city's neighborhood watch, uh, crime prevention and surf groups. Um, we expanded our reach. We're gonna continue building on that network. 
and uh, we are going to make sure that contact stays fresh and we're going to continue um, asking for their partnership and uh, with regard to the uh, mobile app, we now have a baseline of the standards after meeting with uh, after the 311 report and uh, meeting with city IT to work towards future improvements of the online reporting tool. Uh, these focus, we're gonna focus on enhancements existing of uh, the existing tool to meet uh, minimum fulfillment thresholds so that uh, eventually we could uh, look to potentially having that integration with 311, uh, the 311 app. Uh, I will uh, now focus a bit on some of the work plan items that uh, are currently underway and that will continue to be worked on. Our social host ordinance, uh, the city attorney's office uh, will complete an amendment to the fireworks ordinance and include social host responsibilities and you'll be seeing that uh, in May. Um, our mobile and online reporting tool through San Jose, although it will not be integrated into Three one uh, San Jose three one one. Uh, currently, we do have uh, once again the interim changes in mind for the existing tool to focus specifically on insufficient online reports and incomplete reports, so that uh, we can uh, uh, and we can work on those items with uh, within the current budget and staffing that we have. So uh, those will be incorporated for the twenty twenty one Fourth of July uh, reporting period. Uh, as far as our interjurisdictional efforts that have started, staff in the Office of Administration, Policy and Intergovernmental Relations reached out to partners at the county and state levels and uh, the city federal lobbyists about potential legislation to ban fireworks in, and increase the prosecution of violators. So uh, we, uh, although this, uh, this effort has begun, the attention of city partners uh, at all levels of the government have really focused on the COVID response and mitigation. So there's still work to be done there and that'll be continuing. And uh, with regard to the fire department and police, we, uh, we reached out to uh, Morgan Hill and Gilroy. Currently, Morgan Hill has um, increased fines for illegal fireworks use. Gilroy's uh, planning to continue to permit safe and sane fireworks on the 4th of July. And uh, that brings us to our funding, uh, our uh, evaluation of funding opportunities. Uh, none of the grant uh, programs re researched were in alignment with the scope or parameters established by the respective programs uh, for this purpose, but staff will continue to uh, look for opportunities to support illegal fireworks law enforcement funding. Our outreach for uh, campaign cultural competency analysis, the uh, city manager's office of communications in partnership with the fire department's communication staff will uh, review the fireworks campaign for cultural relevancy in the summer of 2021. So that's coming up and they plan to launch a uh, refreshed campaign material uh, for, uh, for fireworks in 2022. Um, review of the citation protocols. Uh, due, pro due process requirements for fireworks citation issuance is currently under review by the city attorney's office and will continue. And uh, our new and revised uh, enforcement strategies uh, that have been uh, fo uh, a focus of our effort recently. Uh, I will uh, hand this off to uh, Captain Taw of the police department to speak more specifically about that. Good afternoon, Chair, Council Members. Uh, my name is Jason Ta. I'm a Captain with the San Jose Police Department. So I will be speaking towards some of our a proposed enforcement actions uh, for this year's 4th of July. So I'm, I'm relatively new to the fireworks committee. So we have been uh, really working hard and listening to the concerns from all over, from the community, from various uh, people within city council, um, looking at the statistics. And so we're really uh, proud to bring a comprehensive enforcement plan that, that really addresses uh, the entire behavior. And this is all dependent upon, uh, of course, being funded for uh, the additional budget expenses of personnel. And just as a, a brief background, we recognize that historically, when we had firearms uh, behavior and firearms violation, correction, fireworks uh, behavior and fireworks um, violations, these were typically during the times that our staffing levels were the most um, tasked, you know, with other calls for service. So we recognized that uh, we needed dedicated funding and dedicated resources to be able to address some of these 
uh, violations. So we've proposed a plan that really addresses the behavior uh, well in advance. So we're looking at applying uh, enforcement practices uh, many, many weeks in advance in preparation for uh, the fireworks on the 4th of July. We're looking at using uh, contemporary as well as traditional law enforcement practices and, and being very highly visible for the day of the event. Um, I'm, I'm going to probably just default towards the, the question and answer phases, but in, in a nutshell, we're going to look at uh, the buying and selling of illegal fireworks uh, within the city of San Jose. We'll be using traditional as well as uh, non-traditional law enforcement tactics and looking at data, uh, really taking into consideration some feedback from city council as well as some of our community groups. And to the extent possible, we're going to gather as much uh, video and, and images that we can use to create what we call a public safety announcement. So this will be a, this PSA will be to educate and defer, deter, correction, deter this type of behavior so we can actually uh, publicize this on our social media platforms uh, after the enforcement activities occur, but before the actual uh, date of the celebration for the 4th of July. So that concludes uh, my presentation. We'll probably take some questions towards the end of this presentation. So uh, with that, I'd like to summarize that we have uh, the work plan items, uh, five complete and seven in progress. Um, and, and I think that uh, really taking an opportunity to say that uh, I think we have uh, work, we've done a lot of work to uh, really address every component of this, this these work plan items. So I'd like to thank uh, for the collaboration, uh, Captain Ta from uh, Police Department, Erica Ray, our uh, Public Information Manager in the Fire Department. Rachel Roberts, the uh, Deputy Director of Code Enforcement and PBCE, and also from Code Enforcement, Maria Diaz Perez, uh, Senior Supervising Admin, and Oscar Carrillo, Division Manager, uh, Jason Gibilisco, who all do a lot of work to process these as they come in, uh, Trevor Gold from City Manager's Office, Diana Yuan from City Attorney's Office, uh, Jerry Drayson from the City Information Technology Department, and um, with that, we will take any questions that uh, the council has, on, or the, sorry, the uh, committee has, and uh, thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we will go over to members of the public first, and um, please raise your hand if you'd like to speak on this item. We have first up caller with the number ending in 5140. And if you're calling in and you wish to unmute, uh, please press star nine. Or sorry, star six. Star nine, raise your hand, star six. And for a uh, caller with the number ending 5140, you're still muted at this moment. So if you can try pressing star six. Okay, we might have some issues and uh, we can come back. Uh, again, this is uh, for our phone caller. And um, so we'll come back to them. Uh, let's go forward to a member, uh, Jeff Levine. There, now I'm unmuted. Thank you, uh, Council Member Perales. Um, my strong recommendation would be uh, given the the usage of fireworks, it, it's, it's out of control, whether it's the 4th of July or New Year's Eve or Super Bowl, to expect law enforcement to, to put an end to it. My strong suggestion for the last several years has been that the city of San Jose needs to uh, partner with uh, the, the neighboring municipalities, including the, the state and federal government agencies to get at the supply of this. Uh, it, what scares me the most isn't necessarily the individual fireworks being shot off on the 4th of July, although that, you know, with the fire danger and everything and the safety aspect, that, that's, that's terrifying enough. But it's the events that happened last month in Ontario, California, where it was the storage, somebody was storing these uh, 
uh, fireworks and it went off, killed two people, injured three, destroyed a lot of property. That's what that's what frightens me. And by going around on the 4th of July to the hot spots, it's not going to address the, the real public safety uh, efforts. And I think we need to make this a, a year round effort where we go after the supply, whether it's fireworks or or a meth lab or whatever. I, I consider it uh, to be one and the same. So that would be my recommendation to the to the city uh, if, if we really ever expect to put a dent in this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, now we'll go back trying to call her with the number ending in 5140, and you'll have to press star six to unmute. There you go. guys. Sorry about that. I was, had to use the bathroom. Anyway, uh, no, I, I don't really see the, you know, the reason to have something year round. Does, you're going to, you guys can't do anything when it's a real crime. I mean, let alone with some kids lighting off firecrackers. I mean, you guys, you know, someone sleeping in a car, it takes an hour for you to come out. So now all of a sudden you guys are hot and heavy for some bottle rockets and firecrackers. I don't see it. You got wild pigs tearing up Almaden Valley. You got coyotes in the neighborhood. I mean, you coyotes in a suburban neighborhood and you guys are going to stop fireworks. San Jose PD is Reno 911. You know, you guys, I mean, I don't have any faith in what you guys can do. And, and what are you going to do when you catch a 12 year old with fireworks and take them to jail? You know, you got, you guys couldn't even take uh, the woman, uh, the woman who was killed, Bambi Larson. You guys couldn't even take that guy to jail who murdered her. You guys let him go again and again and again. And now all of a sudden some kid playing with fireworks is going to, is going to be the big bust of the year on July 4th when he should probably be able to do it anyway. Maybe there should be designated areas to do fireworks. So people aren't criminalized for celebrating the, the independence from uh, England in 1776. Like I say, you 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 guys are Reno 911, and all of a sudden you want to act like TJ Hooker. I yield my time. Okay, thank you. Next speaker is uh, Blair Beekman. Hi, thank you, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, to clarify uh, my ending public comment, my, my, my previous public comment, um, you know, we can really address uh, uh, gun issues at the interstate and federal level. Uh, you know, at the, at the federal level, they're, they're introducing new programs to address ghost guns and the like. And it's an interstate issue that we can address it better. And that way we don't have to bust the people at the local level. And, you know, just good everyday people. And it really seems applicable to this situation. And what the first caller, uh, a public comment uh, for this item, he really smartly offered the idea that, you know, go towards the, the warehouses, go towards the manufacturers process. I, that really seems the way to address certain issues at this time. Go for the interstate issues instead of so much busting people at the local level. And, uh, I don't know. It, it really seems like a way to uh, address this issue that doesn't hurt people at the, at, the, at the local level. And so I'm interested in that thinking. You know, it really needs to be noted that, uh, how much time do I have left here? Uh, it really, boy, the, okay, I have 43 seconds. It really needs to be noted that, uh, you know, last summer, the SJ, SJPD and I think many police departments, they were giving away fireworks to, to the community, you know, because they wanted to make up for the George Floyd things and uh, try to create some sort of, sort of peace out of that. And, you know, I, I, it, this is a big issue to, to deal with and we want to treat it well and, and don't uh, hopefully over surveillance the issue and don't make it an issue of people tattling on each other, I guess, so much. I don't want, you know, neighbor against neighbor kind of thing. And it's, it's a lot to balance. Good luck on how we all can work on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Blair. Okay, and our last speaker is Gil Zamora. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to uh, comment that um, I think it's great to see uh, a comprehensive approach to mitigating this issue by targeting supply chains and instituting the social host ordinance. Um, I think that giving the public a resource to assist the fire and police to help identify violators will go a long way to reducing the use 
of illicit fireworks in San Jose. This is obviously a qu quality of life issue uh, for neighbors and uh, citizens of San Jose. Uh, you know, you guys have identified at least two times uh, the year. It becomes a major issue for people with uh, pets and so forth. And um, most people in the neighborhood are not complaining about the sparklers. What they're complaining about is the loud bombs that are going off that are really disrupting the neighborhoods. And I, and I think that uh, this component with the social host ordinance, I think will be a great tool for the police department. More importantly, I think that their by, by situation, their undercover work is going to um, uh, translate into a lot of uh, uh, reduction in those uh, large uses of uh, uh, fireworks. And, and I'm hoping that uh, you'll support this and that you'll continue. This is not gonna happen overnight. Um, I think the uh, city council should support it um, over at least a three-year period and evaluating each year how they're doing. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much, Gil. And we'll now bring it back to the committee. And uh, first up is Councilmember Jimenez. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, just, uh, I, I think that uh, <laughs> the last community member had it right in that uh, this is a process that's gonna take some time. This has been on the radar for many, many years. Um, but uh, I'm happy to see that it seems like we're making some progress. So uh, let me just also thank the many folks involved in this, including obviously Chief Estrada, Captain Ta, City Manager's Office, and of course the host of community members, some of which commented during the course of this meeting, but many others that I know are watching but are not commenting. Uh, so uh, I, I just wanna say that I think we're going in a good direction. Um, I will be moving to, to cross-reference the, uh, the memo to the full council. Um, I do have a few questions though, um, and uh, I apologize if some of this was evident via the presentation. Every time, sometimes when I have questions, I go back and look at the presentation and I write, try to rethink everything that was said to make sure it wasn't already covered. So uh, I don't think that's, a, I think that's the case here that it wasn't covered, but uh, as it relates to um, the cost of the pilot, did we, I know we're gonna explore sort of funding sources, but was there any, uh, I guess I'm hoping that someone can elaborate on that a little bit. Are we gonna look at the budget? Are we, I know, I think there was a mention of grants by Chief Estrada, I think is what I recall hearing, but I'm hoping someone can touch on that. Uh, I can address that question. Thank you, Please. council member. So tentatively right now, the cost of the proposed enforcement plan is hovering around 37,000. This, this would cover, I believe about eight enforcement operations, proposed enforcement operations. Eight, 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 uh, eight what, uh, Chief Estrada? Is, is it eight, eight sort of personnel, eight, eight officers, eight? No, that would be, council member, that would be eight oh, sorry. operations. Yeah, so they, there would be, uh, eight different operations, which would cover eight different days, and they would occur at various times, uh, well in advance of the actual event, um, and then the the weeks preceding the event, and of course, the day of the event. Okay. So thirty-seven thousand. And I apologize. I, I looked down at my notes as you started talking, <laughs> and Chief Estrada was right in front of me, so I thought it was him talking. So I apologize, Captain Todd. Okay, so thirty-seven thousand. All right, cool. Um, and Council Member, um, this is Jennifer McGuire. We are planning to include that in the City Manager's proposed budget, so we okay, can wonderful. so That's we can proceed. So I figured that was where the crux of your of your questions going. So you you have been around long enough to know where we're going. When we're yes, I do. <laughs> So I very much appreciate that because I was going to ask that. Um, the other thing I was going to ask is that, uh, and I think uh, for uh, Chief Estrada, I think my team has reached out to your office. Obviously, you've been very receptive to hearing us out. And I think some of my staff members have had discussions with you about just the data and such. And I think some of the constraints on that has been just the personnel. Obviously, you guys are very busy. There's a lot going on. And so... Uh, with that in mind, the online the online reporting, the 342, uh, I guess, reports, do we have a sense as to how that breaks down as to where these are happening, right, uh, and where the reports are in the city? Like, is it District 5, District 2, particular neighborhood? Any, any sense of that? So um, what I'll do is I'll answer, and then if there's anything uh, Rachel Roberts uh, wants to or can add, then I'll ask her to do that. So essentially, there is a geotag for these, these reports. Um, there's not an overlay that that 
applies to the city council districts. This is part of the ask, and what we're, we're going to do is actually going to be, we've already had a meeting to take a look at the, the functionality within the tool. So what can we configure? How can we make it act different? And how can we make the user interface better and easier? So we're looking at what's possible within the existing tool. Next, we're going to be focusing on, uh, as I stated in the presentation, the, uh, un, the, the reports that are uh, either insufficient uh, because they lack what's necessary to meet that, that uh, minimum standard for, for a warning or a citation, and then uh, see the nature of those, and then we'll take a look at those that are incomplete. So if there's any way that we can build that in, um, we're going to try to make those changes um, in our first flush. And um, with that, there will be the requirement, and we do have scheduled time with uh, City IT, but all need additional resource to really take a closer look at that data and do some of that crunching. So, um, Rachel, okay. anything to add? Um, no, I think you covered it well. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Uh, I, again, never been around, been around a few years. I, I sense uh, some of the responses and some of the asks that we're putting forward to you are, are really tied around budget as well, right? And, and so what I'm curious about, and maybe back to you, Jennifer, is uh, do you, uh, is this going to be part of the budget ask? I, I don't know how much that would cost or if that's going to be part of this uh, I think it's worthwhile to start breaking down the data a little bit. Uh, and I'll tell you why I think it's important. You know, I've emphasized to my residents that have reached out to me about this, and, and I think they've uh, they've taken to this, and some of them actually brought it up to me. And, and, and the fact is this is just to start somewhere, right? Even if it's a small area in the city, like the pilot, the pilot right? Uh, knowing that we don't have a resources to control the whole city, but start somewhere, even if it's small. But with that, I think we need the data to show exactly where some of the calls are coming from. I think we in two know, and in certain neighborhoods know where some neighbors are more neighborhoods are more active than others. And, and so I think there's that sense. Uh, but I think we need the data. And so if this can be wrapped up into the budget ask, uh, if you will, from the city manager's office, I think it'd be worth a worthwhile effort to start nailing down exactly where this is happening. Okay. Right now, it's not. Um, we haven't really discussed that in depth. We can we can take a look at that um, to see if anything's possible in that regard. Given we're we're getting close to production of that document, but we'll take yeah. a look. Okay, yeah, and I know uh, you know our our office has talked to Chief Estrada, but we haven't really gotten down to how much it would cost, right? So I yeah, guess. that's the part exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and I so think, you know, we also need to see is, can we do this with existing resources um, as well? Sure. We, so um, Chief Estrada yeah. and I can have an offline conversation about that after this meeting. Yeah, and I, and I think we, we at the city already have a lot of smart folks breaking down a lot of data as it relates to encampments, as it relates to, you know, just a host of things, right? And so I think it'd be a worthwhile effort. Uh, with that, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, move the approval of this uh, memo, uh, this update, uh, status report, and, and cross-referencing it to the full council. Second. And if, and if I may add, I'm sorry to jump in again, um, we, you know, we, we asked for a cross-reference, which would be the normal time frame to go to, to May 4th, but that, it turns out that the administration's review of that agenda is going to be quite a heavy agenda. So we respectfully request that we cross-reference to May 11th and just wanted to do that now so the, any public would hear what date it would be in front of the full council. But yeah, consideration. Ha yeah, happy to cross this to, to May 11th. I, I, I didn't know if you needed us to be super specific, but yeah, that works. Thank you. Okay, that's fine with the seconder. Yes. Second. Oh, I didn't know if that was already seconded. Yeah, council member uh, Mahan had it. And uh, now uh, council member Mahan, go ahead. Thanks, Chair. I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, Councilor Jimenez uh, covered most of my questions, which had to do with, with budget, and I, I think got all those answered. I, I will just say, I'm sure you all are more than aware of this, but um, in addition to kind of noise and, and a range of concerns, I, you know, for at least in District 10, and I would imagine this being true for a number of other districts, um, you know, Council Members Jimenez and Arenas have, similar to District 10, a, a lot of interface between the kind of urban rural or, or wild land um, spaces. And so I'm just, I'm just personally very concerned about fire um, in many parts of, of our district and worry about something catastrophic happening. So I, I, do, I do think it's a really serious issue. I hear a lot about it. It's certainly more than just concerns about noise. Um, but again, I, I know I'm sure everyone here is very well aware of that. 
Um, you know, I guess the, the area I was hoping to dig a little deeper was, was the 311 app, and, and I appreciate all the comments on that. And I, I guess my understanding at this point that I want to just clarify or correct if I'm wrong is that the primary barrier to implementing this reporting into 311 is a fulfillment concern, a concern that we'd have a lot of reports and then not be able to adequately follow up on them and, and close the loop with the reporter, the person reporting, which makes sense to me. On the other hand, um, going back to a question Councilmember Jimenez just asked, it, it seems to me that if we want to get data at scale, this is one of the best ways. It shouldn't be the exclusive way that we collect data, but it certainly is a way to get thousands and thousands of data points, I would think, that could be really helpful. And I feel like there ought to be ways to kind of communicate clearly what the fulfillment expectations ought to be as, as we pilot this or roll this out. So I guess I just want to try to get a little more detail about the timeline and next steps for trying to get this included into 311, assuming that that's a, a shared goal. It's certainly something I think would make sense. So specifically to the, uh, the, the, the roadmap for the 311 report that came out in uh, that was presented in in January uh, laid out some basic milestones that need to be met. So those are the first targets, and we're doing that with current budget and current staff. So the first flush is we have to get better, um, and as presented, we're looking at incomplete and um, those that uh, have insufficient information. So there's such a large number of those. Taking a first flush at that really figuring out um, what the data says. And, and that, like I said, is a, prior, a work that's already in progress. Um, once we get close to that goal, we are working with uh, the city IT um, department and we're gonna continue that collaboration. So they're part of the, they're part of the solution, they're part of the path. Um, so first steps are internal within the group and in collaboration with uh, fire IT, city IT and those other departments uh, that are already participating members. Uh, to look at the uh, look at the data uh, closer to see what the nature is of those those incompletes and, and uh, insufficients, uh, and then take a look at the tool to figure out how we can potentially get better and and improve the uh, really the fulfillment part of it. So um, that gives us a lot of opportunity to make improvements uh, to basically uh, get that closed loop, and, and so those are the first things that we're going to be doing. Because with that, uh, we'll have a much better, closer uh, target to hit from there. So uh, the work that's going on now is really uh, is really that assessment. And some of it, like I said, has already started. And some of it is planned for this week, next week, and and and, and plan to uh, take effect before the Fourth of July reporting period. Uh, so specifically to the three one one tool, uh, tool the app, um, uh, that would be a, a, a that would be where City IT would be the appropriate responder for that. Okay, but the first part is a prerequisite for inclusion in 311 from your perspective. Yes, that's where that's where we started. We we really figured out, we tried to figure out how do we get to yes and how do yeah. we get to the point and uh, the items and aired and concerns that were expressed in the 311 report, I believe they were valid. Uh, if we don't have fulfillment and we don't have customer satisfaction, um, in the end, we would be degrading that tool. Yep. Um, so, like I said, focusing on getting better within what we have, uh, with what we have, and then that will get us closer to that that mark. But um, those that's that's the uh, established game plan right now, and it's uh, tracking through uh, May for the new uh, July uh, reporting period, and then we'll continue to reevaluate. Re and okay, thanks. Back, back in, in August. That's what I wanted. Yeah, I just wanted to better understand the, the timelines. So you're saying we would. What would happen by August? Well, we're coming back to to report to to, his, uh, to the committee in, in August is what I see as our our schedule. Okay, and would that be a point at which you think we would have maybe achieved a threshold of of um, understanding of how to deliver the service that we'd be ready to discuss inclusion of the service in three one one, or or would there be additional steps that you anticipate at that point? Um, that would probably be something that I would uh, I would say that we need to have city IT involved in that conversation. Um, right now, we did take a pretty close look at wh what it is that we need uh, to start answering in terms of what where are we failing and what what are we what are we um, 
what are we capturing? So um, there's a, until we look at that, I think we don't actually have a true scope of the actual, or the size of, of, of what we're working on. And for those changes that we make, uh, we'll measure those to see how close we are. Got it. Okay. So by August, we'll have a better assessment of if you've gotten to yes on your side, on your end of things, basically. I, yeah, I would say that'd be the appropriate time for a reassessment. Got it. Okay. If I could add, Chief uh, Estrada, um, I think I think to add to that would be that you know the Fourth of July period is a really big big uh, time for us in terms of firework enforcement, and so being able to make steps to uh, improve the tool now that could hopefully be implemented. I think the chief would agree we're planning to have those in place by the time we get to the 4th of July, we'll be able to test run those improvements and, and see how we how we do. And if we are getting closer to that 80% threshold, and then we'll know, as he said, um, at that August report, you know, how we think we are um, progressing towards that end goal. Okay, great. Thanks. That's helpful. Makes perfect sense that the 4th of July would be a, a key test case and that we would, we would be reflecting in August. That's great. And you mentioned the 80% threshold and just refresh my memory where, so 80% is where we would, we would want to be at that point after this 4th of July test period. Uh, where are we today? What's the Delta? Well, if you eliminate all the incompletes, which basically means the reporter abandoned the tool. They didn't enter any information. So we don't have a clear understanding if they just didn't understand how to file a report or maybe they decided to use the phone line instead. You know, we still have some uh, information to learn in that regard. But if you remove those incomplete reports and only look at those that had some information or were complete enough to take an action, we're actually at 15%. So, um, so you know, we have a long ways to go, but... Um, <laughs> But we're, we're hopeful with some of the strategies we've developed that we can make some real improvements. Okay. And you, and sorry, my last question on this, but that's really helpful. Um, do you believe that the strategies you've identified for July and the resources you've requested in this budget cycle give you a real shot at getting to 80% this year? That's yours, Hector. <laughs> well, I, I think that... Um... I know you don't have a crystal ball. I'm no, just, I, no, you know, I think, I'm just I think the, the, what the, trajectory the, we're on. The most, the, the most accurate and truthful answer is, is that we don't know exactly what the true size of the, of the change is because we haven't looked at the data. If, if, if I took a look at the data and I saw that, that a certain percentage was just, uh, well, there was no ability to, to resolve or, or uh, have fulfillment achieved because it had one thing in it and there was no contact information and there was no, no actual report um, because we do collect a lot, of, a lot of reports that are for the most part blank. So you can't really solve or resolve that problem for that person. All you have is, a, is a, you may not even have a way to get back to them. So we're gonna look for those types of things too. So until, I have a, until we have a really good idea of kind of where that, what that breakdown is, so that analysis, that detailed analysis, um, it would be very difficult and premature, and I think a bit careless to, to say that we're going to be here at this time. Sure. Uh, once I have that, though, I would feel more comfortable providing a, an estimate. Um, but uh, unless I had, uh, I want to make sure that I'm not assigning any work, and I don't want anybody to take on any work that they can't, because everyone, uh, um, everyone's doing great. Um, everybody's making everything work to the extent that they can. And um, everybody's pushing. Uh, we're really leaning forward into this, and we're trying to get some achievement on it. So, um, so yeah, that would be my most honest and um, I think um, accurate response to your question. Great, thank you. No, I, I can. I know I can tell from the report how much work's going into it, and I really appreciate it. And um, appreciate you taking the time to help me better understand where we're at and, and where we might be after the fourth. Certainly, certainly an issue. I know my community, my district cares a lot about. So thank you. And that's all I had, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and yeah, thank you uh, for the report back. I, I too appreciate the progress. This has been many years, um, as, as uh, many of you know, many years in the making. And uh, we've had uh, some slow progress, but nonetheless, we've had progress and a lot of challenges in front of us. But 
uh, appreciate things like the social host ordinance uh, moving forward, which has been a hurdle in the past, and uh, and obviously looking forward to to getting a better handle. Last year was really challenging, and I think we as council members expressed that uh, our community members we heard it from, and for anybody that lived in the city of San Jose, I think um, it, it it appeared as though uh, it was a lot worse than than in in years past. And, um, and certainly want to be able to get a better handle on it. And I think there's a lot of different strategies that we're, we're attempting here. In regards to uh, the reporting, this is along the lines of uh, Councilmember Mahan was already focusing on. But I'm just curious um, if we know today the most common errors, if, if we can denote them as errors that residents make or, or, or maybe omit um, in their reporting that, that then get us to, to, for instance, where we were with the Lunar New Year, where only 6% had sufficient information to follow up on. You want me to take this one? <laughs> so, um, well, as I was, uh, mentioned with, with Council Member Mahan, um, you know, a good majority of the reports just don't actually have any information at all. But the ones that do provide some information, um, they usually will omit some piece of information that we need in order to take action. So. They may leave out an address or they may uh, just be um, too vague in, in the description. So they might say, you know, around the corner from the 7-Eleven off of, you know, First Street or something like that, where we don't really have a location we can pinpoint or a property we can attribute the um, activity to. So that's probably the most prominent um, situation we encounter where there's not enough information to take an action. Um, Okay. We do yeah. follow up though, like if we have their uh, contact information and, and we can follow up with them and have a conversation um, to try and get more information, we do do that, but it, that also is not always complete and therefore we can't take action in that regard. Yeah, I, I understand obviously pretty challenging when you have really just a lack of, of any information, but I think where I, I see some progress we can make would be if it looks like there's an omission of something, maybe by accident or just because of lack of clarity, as you describe uh, in some of these where maybe they're just not as clear on the location, stuff like that. And that, in my mind, is a good education starting point for us to try to figure out how do we get those ones across the line, right, to get a little bit more info um, for the individuals that aren't really putting any information at all. I, you know, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know what we can do there, right, to get a better understanding, but at least I think we start with the lower hanging fruit, which would be uh, those that are only missing you know, a pieces of information and, and how do we educate our community members on that. And what's helpful for us as council members, as we promote the tool, if we can know these things, right, then we can go out and tell our community members, by the way, don't forget this, right? And, and, and so um, it's very helpful and we can help out in, in, in that regard too. So um, otherwise, uh, my colleagues focused on uh, what I was interested in as well. So we have uh, a motion and a second, if we can do a roll call vote, please. Arenas? Yes. Jones? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jimenez? Aye. Corrales? Aye. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Motion passes unanimously and we're now going back to item uh, D2, which is our fire department uh, call volume status report and um, I'm going to step away for just a minute, so I'm going to hand the gavel over to uh, our vice chair, Councilmember Jimenez, in case uh, uh, this presentation follows up or finishes up before I return. Just making sure everybody can hear. This is Captain Captain Staley from the fire department. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Just making sure the appropriate slides up there too for the fire department call volume. So. Thank you, Vice Mayor, uh, City Council, committee members, and uh, members of the public for the opportunity to deliver the call volume for the San Jose Fire Department. Uh, I'm the Operations Captain, Josh Staley, for the Fire Department, and through this short PowerPoint, I'll cover the uh, call volume status report, and I'll present the call volumes with regards to population, our five battalions, our business areas within the city, uh, station locations, call type, age, age distribution and what we're going forward with uh, to meet the call volume demands of our city. And then I'll take questions at the end if uh, time permits. So for slide one, uh, this is the standards of response coverage and it goes over the call volume and population. 
So for the San Jose Fire Department, uh, we consider ourselves all hazard and what that includes, and it's been alluded to kind of through the, the stuff that Chief Estrada talked about was fire, and it's not just structure, but it's also the wildland response, and we had an unprecedented year in 2020, but also with uh, EMS, emergency medical response, and our force of paramedics out there delivering medical care every day, uh, rescue, hazardous materials, urban search and rescue, and that's anything from water, high angle rescue, to trench rescue, the changes in our society today with active shooter events, hostile events, and then the pandemic that we are still currently dealing with. Uh, San Jose Fire Department call volume has increased 26% over the last decade. And with that increase, we have to increase our, uh, our resources and the facilities that facilitate what our response is. So the call volume is increased at a faster rate than the population, as you can see from the graph on the screen, the population growth for the city of San Jose, we had a little dip last year, but it's grown at a rate of 5% over the last decade. So for us to keep up with it, uh, we'll look at fire, which has increased 2% over the last every, every year and then 2.6% for EMS calls every year. And so I'll go forward and, and demonstrate that for you. So this slide demonstrates our call volume by battalion. So in the city, we have five battalions they cover the city and it, this breaks down each station within those battalions by color. So you can see with the highest, it's in the core of our city. So battalion one that is downtown, uh, the most call volume is, is downtown and then the lowest, which goes at the perimeters or edges and I'll demonstrate through a heat map in the next slide. But this call volume demonstrates a single response. So a medical call would be a single response. What it does not reflect is a majority event like a fire where it will require up to let's say 10 apparatus each fire is considered one event which might take up more apparatus so it will draw more towards that area leaving a gap for us to cover where other resources will have to come in behind should there be a medical call in that first due area so this just demonstrates where our call volume is at the busiest pieces and the busiest companies and I'll also show later in the slide where the new stations that we're building will help cover those areas through sources like Measure T. So this is just a quick demonstration of the five battalions and the engines that cover behind each battalion and where we are busiest and it continues to grow every year. So for this, I had our uh, graphic information services, our GIS person develop a heat map and this is over a year with the call volumes that you currently saw. So with this, you can see downtown and it, the numbers are the labeled stations and the red represents our biggest call volume, our heat map. With this over the year, you can see downtown through the corridor, kind of through Alum Rock and then down um, would be Monterey Highway or Monterey down the center of the city is our, is our busiest areas, but this fluctuates. I know we talked about fireworks, but during the summer, June, July, August, the east side will fluctuate to red with our heat map be getting busier with our uh, wildland urban interface. So any company that touches up against the edge of our city that will have a wildland response. So this is over a year and it does vary during times. So with the call volume map, we also generated another map and this is according, I'll slide it over. It's called a late response map, but the reason we call it a late response map is according to the travel times for the citywide compliance. So for the citywide compliance, it goes over the standards of response for the fire department. We labeled it late, and that's kind of misleading, but it's the travel time of more than four minutes. So this is not based on the county EMS based responses. This is our total city responses to any emergency. So EMS, fire, rescue, which might take multiple resources. And you can see from this late response map, it kind of mirrors what our heat map is. So our most of our resources and our downtown battalion generate a lot of calls. So the resources have to come from further away to collapse down to cover the area that's being utilized. And this again is over a year as well. And this will fluctuate according with the season, like wildland season in 2020, we had the major fire within, our, within the edge of our city. So a lot of wildland response, it ended up being red on the eastern foothills where you see station 19 to 21 
and then we would bring in the wildland companies from Almaden Valley and we'd have to backfill or cover those stations. So the, the heat map for this just shows the response that we have to cover behind in greater than four minute responses. Now with the next map, this is what we're, we're doing. I, sorry, it's a little bit busy, but you can see where the red dots our stations currently lie. The green map is the proposed station. So the three new stations, so you have 37, 32, 36, 37 is currently under construction under Measure T. The yellow is station 33 up on Comms Hill that has currently been closed, but these will cover gaps in coverage for us should we get the resources and funding to help us uh, mitigate those heat maps downtown and on the eastern foothills and our busy battalions so we can cover the resources and personnel needed. Uh, so we're excited for the growth. It's, it's a great thing moving forward and we're excited to get new people. We actually have an academy starting Monday uh, 25 personnel. So we're, we're excited to move forward and get new people underneath us so we can keep growing with our uh, with our growing city and the population growing. So this pie chart will uh, demonstrate the call type distribution for us, what, what we're responding to, what the call volume is built from. And you can see the, the big gray piece in there. 62% of it is from EMS. It's emergency medical response. People are calling because they're sick or they're hurt and then it's kind of broken down by false alarms. But for each type of these calls, year by year from last year, you can see we ran 91,595. But from the last year, at this point, we are the same. We are 1% point away from the last year's distribution. Uh, so we have a slight increase in fire incidents, but we have a de decrease in fire alarms and false calls. And that's because of our uh, Bureau of Fire Prevention and our updates to our uh, dispatch center. So they are processing calls to make us more efficient. So thanks to BFP and thank you to dispatch who are, who are processing basically 92,000 calls every year to get us out the door to put the most efficient resource at the call front. So you can see the breakdown here and this is shared in the memo to everybody. And then unclassified would be like an undetermined call. I know it's up there, but that, that generates a lot of call where we have to figure it out. They can't figure it out through dispatch. So you can see how it's broken down from fire and it's, it's increasing every year. So for this, the majority of our calls got 62%. Emergency medical services, which is increasing 2.6% each year. The, the heat map for that is an eight minute response is the precedent by the county, but it's increasing at 2.6. And if we don't keep our paramedic force up, it, it makes it tough to keep it at that our goal is above 90% response for the call volume that we're required to do. So you can see that we ran close to 57,000 medical calls last, last year, and we're on track to beat that this year by 3%. So other call types would include in the orange, which is like fire or rescues. But again, those, those are multiple apparatus, which would be multiple engines, trucks, chiefs responding. So it's, it's more than one engine or truck that will be responding. So the blue you see is usually usually one apparatus that's responding an engine, whereas the orange is multiple apparatus. So it's increasing every year and, it, and it's going up slightly more than the population. So with the increase in stations and personnel, we can keep up with the call volume that's ever increasing. And the last piece before I, I conclude, we have broken down the age distribution in a simple breakup by persons needing medical care. So dispatch will utilize the CAD and their processing through triaging 911 through EMS uh, priority dispatch, which helps the paramedics and EMTs break down what we're going to. And you can see the age distribution, age, sorry, age distribution. Some of the basic questions will ask the person on the other line. Uh, so this helps us treat. But from this, we generated from uh, CA.gov an increase in facts and reporting. So from the city of San Jose or the Santa Clara County will increase from 2010 to 2060, the age 60 you see on there the most will increase by a 203% in the next 40 years. So if we don't increase our, our force, our personnel and staffing, it'll be tough to keep up with the requirements that we have for the what the city would appreciate us to deliver service to the people of San Jose. And then for the, for the last piece, uh, so for us to continually Provide effective service to the city of San Jose. We'll uh, need to meet the city's call volume and demands. So our response times, improve initiatives and performance. 
and optimize the critical view through fire stations, which we are building like in Measure T, and we'll continue constructing responses are funded through our dispatch, BFP, and the department will engage in the county and state levels to advance the effective and sustainable EMS uh, responses that we give. So that's all I have for my short PowerPoint, and then I'll take any questions should the committee have any. Thank you very much. Go over to members of the public first, and we have uh, Blair Beaton. Hi, thank you. Uh, I wish Paul Soto was here today, but he's not. Uh, hi to Paul. <laughs> um, for this item, uh, I am uh, I'm interested in the call numbers and how that is, uh, I don't know, indicative indicative of how to talk about our, our future of, of reimagine. And you know, with with the first item today that talked about police issues. There isn't quite a sense yet that we can talk about these items in terms of what exactly is reimagined. And we're, you know, I, it's taken a lot, I think, in the past year just to be able to feel comfortable that reimagine and equity, I mean, real good equity ideas are like incredibly idealistic and good and decent and like the better parts of our human nature and human thinking. But yet, for some reason, it's kind of a bit dismissed and not fully respected. And we're going to take our time before we better commit to such ideas. And um, but yet, you know, you, you're offering MCAT services today at the meeting. So, you know, it's, it's a give and take. It's a back and forth. <laughs> you know, it's a lot to go back and forth with. And I'm, I'm hoping for the day that, you know, I mean, how incidents relate to, you know, that maybe people are calling the fire department more to avoid the police. Maybe they're wanting to f find a way to trust their government somehow. And using the police, the fire department is a way to do that and to get health hu and human services needs. You know, I mean, uh, how, how are we going to better address health and human services need, needs? How do we have a more open, proactive approach to this subject matter and not feel that, oh, the police can solve all these issues? There's still that mentality. Why don't we, I hope we can start thinking about real creative health and human services ideas to, Thank you, to Blair. how we address it. Uh, okay, that's the end of our public speakers and we'll bring it back to the committee. Don't see any hands raised at the moment. I have a couple uh, questions. Hey. So uh, thank you for the, the presentation and, and uh, Captain, looking at the, the data there, um, you have broken down the 62% medical emergencies. Do you happen to know the data of how many of those involved individuals in the unhoused community? Yeah, thank you for the question, council member. We, we do, we actually have uh, our infras reporting system, which is a mandatory thing we do after every call and it captures actually through the Bureau of Fire Prevention, we put it in there for the unhoused, it is captured in our infras reporting. So you can draft that data out of the system we use as firehouse. So it's just a, it's a generated call totals and it'll, it'll tell us after every call and you can derive that data if needed. Okay, and that's not something you have uh, offhand today that you know? I do not have it, sir, today, but I can look it up and get that information to you if you would like it. Yeah, I'd like it uh, offhand and I'd also like that for uh, to be included within the demographic, at least under medical emergencies, the under medical emergency section in future reports to be able to know those that are in the unhoused community. And I actually will piggyback on what uh, Blair was saying in regards to our work that we're doing on reimagining public safety. And I'll ask this to our uh, assistant city manager. It is incorporating potentially calls that maybe the fire department responds to also included in, in what we'll be looking at the scope of that work on reimagining public safety. We're, right now we're not. Um, we're, we're the the committee that the committee has actually met two times the the forty five person committee and they're focused on police right now. That certainly could be another phase at some point here for sure. And there may be there may there may be intersections that come out of that committee's work that would that would naturally go into that. We will have a, a 
next month at this committee meeting, we will have an update about what's happening with reimagining. And so maybe we'll be able to tell you more then. Okay. Uh, and, and is it possible to bring a recommendation like that back to them? Could, could we filter that through you and you can raise that as a, as a, a topic? Um, I'll stop there and then I'll elaborate. Yeah, um, I think we could. I mean, we, we have a definite timeline with this group that we've committed to, and it's already really challenging with them looking at use of force with the IPA. And I think we're very challenged with it. We're meeting, they're meeting every other week. And I, I think we're going to be challenged just to complete on time. And we've got a consultant. So I think um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to Angel Rios, Deputy City Manager Angel Rios, who's, who I've got leading that effort. And, um, and we'll, we'll definitely see what we could do with regards to that. Because there's definitely overlap with those type of calls, for sure. We, we, don't, we need to have the right hand uh, doing what the left hand needs to do it for, for efficiency purposes. So I understand your point. Well, and, and, and rather than, than bog down the work, because it sounds like there is a lot and it's crunched, I, I would be comfortable, uh, and, and as they, you know, this maybe what we call phase one work gets completed, I'd be comfortable going back to the council and seeing if the council would support a phase two, right? And where yeah. maybe things that we didn't we didn't accomplish this time and things that weren't even on the agenda. For instance, I, I do think there's a lot of overlap here. Mm -hmm. We know what we're hearing from the, the fire department, um, which is seriously with, uh, or, or, uh, with a growing population, there is a serious need for increased fire services. But I think additionally, we can look at creatively are we also expending uh, our firefighters responding to calls that maybe don't need a firefighter to go respond to, right? And, um, and should we be uh, considering who else? And, and quite frankly, if we're thinking about doing that already with the police department, uh, there could be an overlap, especially when it comes to those in the unhoused community. A lot of those calls, as we know, deal with, um, uh, uh, I think, you know, just a, a few main things, mental health, uh, uh, substance abuse, Right, uh, and and so if if we're we're already kind of looking at that reimagining on who might what professional might respond to those calls, um, right? A strict medical emergency again, where maybe just a, a transport is needed, and and so uh, that would be my interest, especially as we're growing as a city. I think we need to look at that. Uh, I know I hear it in the downtown core, and it's not just from the uh, the unhoused community; it's from the recently housed unhoused community. For instance. Uh, Second Street Studios has a high call volume for our fire department. Um, and so although they may be, individuals may be housed now, the fire department is still seeing a lot of those calls that they would have been going out to in, in the encampments, they're now going out to in uh, the permanent supportive housing development. So we haven't reduced the call volume on our, our, our firefighters. And so in my mind, we need to be looking at how do we and you know, how do we utilize our resources differently much like we're doing with the police department i think we need to be looking at that with the fire department and again i hear this time and again with our downtown firefighters and when you look at the heat maps here you see that there's this high concentration in the downtown core what i'd like to see in the future reports uh captain would be right that that how do we how do we separate out um this specific uh, area uh, of those within our unhoused community. And so uh, if that's something you can send to me offline and uh, maybe copy the, the, the uh, committee here. Uh, and then um, and then if you can include that in future reports and, and I'll, I'll, I'll say to, uh, to yourself, uh, city manager, that, that uh, I think I'll take back the recommendation that maybe this is something you propose to the, um, the task force now and that we instead look at what items might we wanna put forward in a phase two. I, I thank you. Um, I do think, though, you know, to the extent that we do have uh, if any of these reimagined services in the police department has an overlap with fire, we do need to put that in a bucket and follow up with whatever comes out of that. So I don't think we need to wait for another committee to be, uh, you know, formed. And I, so I think, you know, what, you know, we're spending a lot of time educating the, you know, this group of, of leaders throughout our community. Also, what type of calls do we respond to? So there's a big, there is a big in-depth police focus here, but I uh, we won't I won't necessarily go back to the committee. But I'm going to make sure that we're capturing those those calls that may intersect with fire and see how we you know don't just leave them to be doing their normal you know course of business. And how do we how do we reimagine those along the way if we're going to be doing something on the police side? So um, we will we'll keep that in mind as we're going along. But then there might be another project to look 
um, at fire solely, um, broad, more broadly, to your point. Great, thank you. It sounds like we can do both, and I, I appreciate that. Um, I'll go over to Councilmember Arenas. Thank you, Chair. Oops. Um, thank you for the 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 report, um, uh, Chief Williams, and uh, and Josh Staley. C captain, now now you can use Captain. Okay, yeah, I was just going to say before I even say anything, you know where I was going, Chair, with this. <laughs> Captain Staley. It's the, it's the one time it would have been correct and you, and you hesitated. <laughs> I was looking at you, Chair, and I was like, nope, not making that one again. <laughs> um, thank you for, for the report. Um, I remember this coming back um, in uh, coming to, to PISVIS in 2018, and I had um, asked for actually for this to continue to come back to PISFIS on an annual basis so we can hear some of the progress that has been made. And um, I know at that time we were moving some of the uh, 311 calls into um, the 911 into the 311 calls and, and that alleviated the system um, a bit. Uh, the, the piece that I don't know if I, I, if I missed or um, I just, I, for whatever reason, if I missed, is to address the off the hook call answering um, and uh, Im implementing some of those audit recommendations um, because I know that was the the that delayed and created a delay for our response time. Is that something that 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 was uh, I'm guessing was worked on because of the audit recommendations is is now uh, has a, a solution to it. Are you asking about the uh, the turnout time, which would be the minute that we have from the time of dispatch to getting on the apparatus to going? Is that is that what you're referencing? Right. I I, th I think there was like a an a off the hook call answering system that that you all use when a call comes in, um, and uh, and then you have to I don't know transfer it over. Uh, I don't know how how that all worked. I, uh, for me, it was a little complex. Um, but I knew that it was an area where it impeded you to, to respond. Uh, it would help our, with our response time. And so it's one of the areas that I, I, I focused on in, in seeing if that had uh, gotten any progress. I know that our chief had committed to improving that, but I, 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 I think because this came in 2019 and uh, at the end of 2019, of course, last year was last year. Um, I'm trying to figure out where we're at in, in that progress. So our, hi, our, oh, go ahead, Chief. Sorry, go ahead. Say, hi, this is Chief Williams. Uh, certainly something that we can look into and follow up with you on. Uh, historically, uh, in some communities, call queuing uh, becomes an issue. So calls are sitting in the queue waiting to be answered, and that's where we lose time often right. um, in, in past situations in various communities. So you're waiting to get the call to the call taker to actually dispatch a resource. So I don't have the specifics because this is my ninth day with the city, but certainly something what? I will follow up on and get And you don't to. have the answer? Unfortunately not, wow. because I don't know the specifics <laughs> on that one, but I will get that for you. I believe you, uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you for, for doing so. I, I know that the, it, we want to make sure that we re, uh, get better response times any way that we can so we can have also uh, that reimbursement from the county that we so, so, so long for. Um, and I'm going to guess that some of the EMS uh, total response, um, the call volume fell uh, short in the uh, city EMS call volume um, quite a bit. I'm looking at page seven, uh, which is chart eight. It's the county ambulance EMS responses versus city EMS responses. It, I'm going to guess it has something to do with last year being last year, but possibly um, a lot of the improvements that we've already, uh, you've already implemented in your department. Um, did we, can we conclude um, all of all of the improvements to to the re reduction? Like, uh, so say for example, the jails are no longer calling in for for and taken away from from EMS attention. Um, I guess all, all of the things that were in the audit, 
is that a reduction in the call volume or do you think that's just part of last year? We still we still respond to the, the you reference the jail. We still respond to the jail, housing consortium, stuff like that. But we have modified our response a little bit. So we will look at what resources and dispatch also looks at what resources are required for each type of call. So we will audit our response depending on. So we have right now we use a three squad model, which is similar to like a large ambulance. It'll go mm -hmm. to lower level calls, whereas we could use an engine with four personnel for let's say like a CPR call that, that require more personnel, but that's part of the triaging that the chief was talking about. Mm -hmm. So we can utilize those resources in the busier areas. So we make those response times. We, we wanna make sure we give the service as fast as we can. And with that heat map, you, you see it. So that's where we put our squads is closer to downtown or down that corridor that's very busy. Right. So we're constantly viewing and editing our response according to like wildland season. We'll put our wildland rigs in service so we can, you know, mitigate that hazard is just an example, but we're mm -hmm. constantly looking at that with our operations and now our assistant chief and fire prevention. We'll look at all that stuff so we can put the resources and build stations in the appropriate places where we need them. I, I hope that answers your question. No, thank you. I, I, I heard the strategy earlier about um, looking at where it's more um, condensed in terms of calls um, and which absolutely makes sense. I know for um, for my district, um, most of it was uh, I think light yellowish, except for around um, the Welch area where it was I think uh, low to medium. Um, I'm sorry, which was orange. But what I was getting to is, do we know uh, about some of those um, strategies that you implemented because of the audit? that helped improve where we are now in terms of response time. So say for example, let's get the, the jail. Um, you're still responding to the jail, um, but I know that was, um, there was some unnecessary uh, 911 calls that were not necessarily emergency, that were non-emergency. And I'm guessing now maybe the jail has an onsite, uh, more access to onsite medical uh, uh, care. So that way, you know, you all don't have to respond every time something uh, medical happens there. Um, and you're saying you're still responding, but there's been a reduction. Yeah, council member, there, there is a, re a reduction and it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a three-way dance because the county jail that we're responding to within our city limits. So it's a communication with the jail, county EMS and us. So it's, it's kind of a three-way dance because the, the ambulance is a private entity and then you have a county facility and within the city of San Jose. So we, we're constantly working with them. So if it's a low priority call, can it just utilize an ambulance? But that's something that the, the chiefs would talk to you as council members. And then you talk to personnel supervisors over the county so we can you know, keep our fire apparatus and our police in service within our city limits. But if right now, if someone calls and they have a serious emergency, we go, I mean, we have to respond. I know they have some, some medical care there, mm -hmm. but we have to give that person the best care we can. And that's just right. the system we have right now. Yeah, that, that's an area that I think that may continue to need some either, uh, like you said, maybe some attention from, from electeds or from maybe from a city manager um, it, it, to me, it, um, it doesn't make sense for, for us to continue to respond to a site that could easily have medical care on site uh, versus bringing in um, our resources to expend. Um, when, when we're trying to strategize on, on improving our response time by, um, by all of these other things, um, so, so anyways, I think that this is still continues to be an area where we can um, make uh, more progress in. And Jennifer, I guess I'm asking, or maybe uh, Chief Williams, uh, is this something that we are hoping to talk to the county about? I think certainly um, system improvements, process improvements are always something that we are attempting uh, to do as an organization with the medical priority dispatching system. 
uh, in which uh, San Jose is recognized as uh, one of the accredited centers of excellence in the United States. Uh, that process has built in algorithms and systems tying to county protocols for EMS response that we currently have to abide by. And so moving forward, we can have those conversations to find out if there are opportunities uh, to look at how we might uh, have process improvements. And uh, I think we constantly engage uh, in that process. So I will do some further research, working with staff, and uh, we will follow up uh, in the future. What, what is that, how, how does that um, take form? Are, are they um, on a continuous basis, like these ongoing meetings with the county, or is it once you, you start looking into an issue, then you um, request a meeting? H how are those system improvements continuing to progress? Well, typically there are quality assurance, quality improvement processes built into the medical priority dispatching system process, uh, as well as the county protocols that are examined and typically uh, looked at on an annual basis. And so I would say it's an ongoing process, but based on your question today, uh, I will look into uh, that matter to see if we can do some more focused research, uh, specifically looking at our responses to county facilities or uh, jails uh, specifically. Uh, Chief, I might be able to provide a little bit more. I was the EMS chief before uh, the Bureau. So um, council member, essentially one of the things that we've been working on for a number of years is our, our work plan items that were tied basically to the audits. So mm -hmm. we have a few, as the chief said, MPDS are basically our, uh, our, um, our process in call processing that allows us to put the best resource on the event, the most appropriate, um, uh, and that uh, helps both reduce the number of calls or number of, of units in service and keeping those um, uh, that are in service and keeping that number as high as possible. We also have with regard to uh, getting to calls faster in that in that response time segment. Um, some of the, the new innovations that were uh, are, are actually working really well for us are the um, the um, the signal preemption, which is lights for our crews. So that's reducing the call time. Uh, and that's also keeping right. minutes in service. Um, the jail is an ongoing process and it's a collaboration with the county EMS. So through uh, the medical director, Dr. Miller, and a few of the others uh, in county EMS, that, that has been an ongoing conversation. Um, I know that most recently, it was probably about uh, a year ago, there were, new, there were two new medical protocols which um, for those things that the chief was talking about, those requirements for us to go to those calls, um, some of them allow for other uh, on-site medical authorities to be able to handle those for us. So the number of calls uh, is basically reduced because the appropriate and approved medical authority is on-site, but for those items, we still do go to the, uh, we just still go to the jail, but um, that work is still in progress. I know that it's not part of my, current house, but I know that it's ongoing. So um, that really that holistic approach to, the, to every part of it uh, and in alignment with, with the audits and the, and the uh, work plan items that we have are how we've been really attacking every segment of the response time. So um, I hope that provided information or clarification. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, I know it's um, when we work with other systems that we have no control over. I know it could be slow. Um, uh, progress. Um, I, I do think that this is uh, an item worthy enough to to have some additional conversations with our county counterparts to see how we can reduce that, especially because this is an area where we're in the red, right? This is where there's a lot of calls um, happening. Um, it's it's not like it's in my district at the at the lower end of the district, southern end of the district where you may not impact, um, you know, if the jail was there, that might not impact it so much, but this is in the red area. So anyways, I, I'll move on. Um, and thank you for, for, for the update. It would be great to continue to um, learn more about um, how to support you all in, in that aspect, um, whether it's, it's a, a conversation with electeds or if it's, you know, whatever is part of that work plan that you're, that you're um, following. Um, the, the last thing I just wanted to ask is uh, in our district, um, in, uh, for district aid, the, the response, there's a, a large late, late response, which is 
orange and it's in the Welch Overfeld. Look at my 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 map. Um, and um, I, I think you know it's because of you know there isn't enough fire stations between District Eight and Five. Um, or, you know, however, those resources, as you were saying, they get pulled into more of the center. Um, and so I think it's leaving uh, Fire Station 16 uh, to pull in for more of those responses. And so I'm wondering, is there any plan maybe to improve uh, the response time in this very specific high call volume area? Council member, I'll, I'll speak to it shortly. I, I, it was tough to see on the map I put up, but station 32, the new station 32 is slated to go kind of between our station two and 16. I'm not sure if you can, the map is a little busy. What chart could, are you on? I'm on, let me look at yours because my the PowerPoint is different than the memo you received. So it was an integrated map inside the PowerPoint. It, it's page six on the PowerPoint if you have that in front of you where it shows all our stations the new proposed stations. Uh, I was going by the, the memorandum, but let me open that one up. Um, what, what, what slide did you say it was? Slide six. Got it. Okay. On the PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Oh you yeah, can... that's the same one I was talking about. Yes. Mm -hmm. Station 32 is, is slated to go there. But on top of that, you also have uh, apparatus that we have put at certain stations. Like station two has a new wildland rig that can better mitigate wildland hazards so they can get back in service to serve the community for EMS. So it's just an example, but 32 would be the big reducing call volume in that specific area where it's, it's you, see, you see it as orange or red to reduce the call volume because it is there is a gap in coverage right there. So uh, okay. our team to put together to, to cover that area station. Uh, okay, but you, you don't have the number 32 on there, right? There's a okay. green dot and it says P32, so proposed 32. That's where it'll, that's where that station will live or go. Oh, I I'm missing. I'm looking at maybe the wrong one. Okay. Um. Uh, I I don't see it on my presentation, but maybe it's on. Oh, I see on on the next one, on, on page. Um. Yeah. Okay. I I now I see it. I was trying to look for it on the red orange map. Oh, so, yeah. so I didn't put. Any I, I appreciate that. Yet. Sorry. I appreciate that. Okay. So, and when is that projected to uh, uh, to be uh, open for business? So I have to get back. Look, I don't want to give you a, a date because it takes a, like a year to build a fire station. Right now, 37's ground is actually broken. So 32, I would guess another year after that. Yeah. So. Okay. And that, a couple of years maybe for groundbreaking. Okay. Well, th those were my questions. I was, um, I was uh, aware of of uh, of the station but in in, in between now and uh, the year that this actually breaks ground you're saying that you're um you're uh using um the the resources a little differently so that you can um uh deploy uh more efficiently to this area in the meantime an example is wild ant season. We will, we will, what we call as upstaff rigs. We'll put a, another engine behind to go backstaff a station that's on. We know it's going to be busy during the summer, so we'll adjust our resources and operations appropriately to, to that. Yeah. I saw, I saw for the summer, but I guess for the the whole year, um, for year round, is 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 that kind of the similar strategy? We would look. We look at it more finite. So we'll look, if we have multiple training sessions during a certain day, we will upstaff and bring more personnel on. We right. know that's going on, but we know typically during the summer, it's our busier call volume. But it's, some, it's something we definitely look at all the time and take recommendations in any way we can besides just more resources and personnel. Thank you. I, I know that we heard earlier um, how we've had more gang um, activity. Um, we've had, um, yeah, of course, some some uh, murders, um, and so it, it, and it's in it's in that area. It's around you know the, probably all those hotspot areas kind of probably overlap. Um, so so I'm you know that's one of the concerns I have to ensuring that we always have um, 
good response time for some of some of these things, especially as we're coming up on summer. I'm guessing that this is only going to increase, unfortunately, um, for our youth. So th those were my questions, Chair. Um, happy to make a motion to approve. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. I don't see any other of my colleagues that wish to uh, speak, so we'll go for a roll call vote now. Arenas? Yes. Jones? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jimenez? Perales? Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the uh, presentation today, gentlemen. And we'll uh, finish up with open forum. And uh, we'll start with caller with the last four digits of 5140. Hey, thanks, guys. Yeah, I've been listening to all these uh, things today. And, you know, the, the, the best thing that could ever happen with the EMS services, first responder, police, fire, the best thing that could ever happen is for them to actually show up. And I don't mean show up like 15 minutes later, an hour later. I mean, like, you know, in proper response time i hear all these budgets and all this money and you know you get these buildings that you know burn down in front of the firehouse and then you gotta you know it takes forever for san jose pd to show up except when something's happening to them like you know remember when there was the beer drinking incident a couple years ago you had like 25 squad cars 60 blue boys show up you guys couldn't handle people drinking beer in a parking lot remember that yeah i remember that uh and you need to show up on time. All these new stations and all this state-of-the-art new equipment and everything, let's just start with showing up on time. You should have all learned that when you were in high school. Something tells me that the people who worked for San Jose were the stoners in high school who never turned on their homework and had every excuse why they were late and every excuse why they didn't finish their homework. You guys are a disgrace. You, I don't understand how anybody could take anything seriously that this city does. The only thing you guys take seriously is code enforcement. Maybe the code enforcement people should get a job at the fire department or the police department because those guys show up right on time if the flagpole's too high or the shed's too close to the fence, right? Those guys are on it, okay? You guys seem to do things really well when it's attached to a ticket or a fine. But anything else, murder, rape, robbery, houses burning down, people having a heart attack, you guys are nowhere to be found. I rest my case. Okay, and next up is Blair Beekman. Hi. Uh, maybe one of the themes of the day is, is ideas of uh, interstate policing and federal policing of, say, guns, fireworks, and uh, good luck in those efforts. Um, you know, I, I tried to speak this past week uh, at, at city council. Uh, I, I took a big swing and a miss again at a uh, uh, possible miss about uh, um, subsidy issues for the future. I hope if nothing else, I've offered good guidelines for that process. Yesterday at the uh, Rules and Open Government, there was uh, uh, the future of uh, uh, Medicare for all that, uh, you know, it's hopeful that that's back in our lives again, which to me is a sign that uh, there's a real chance of good sustainability along uh, coming back into our lives again. And we can talk about that. And that's really good, <laughs> you know, and uh, what, what the future of peace and sustainability can be. Today, I wanted to try to mention ideas of a uh, environmental future and planning in San Jose for the future of San Jose. Um, the San Jose Spotlight reported, they have been reporting about, you know, about the issue of uh, the, um, what's it called? The uh, system for, uh, it's a backup emergency generator system that uses uh, 
hydrogen fuel cell technology. And it's a big deal of the mayor that it's my personal feeling he's done this for emergency backup generators purposes in case there's a large earthquake that may be very possible in our next few years. And he wants to create that instead of uh, simply uh, uh, using dirty fuel and energy at that time as backup generator use. We need to consider, can these fuel cells use other forms besides natural gas? And those are the sorts of questions we Okay, thank you very much. Uh, meeting is adjourned.